Okay, folks, we're going to start a minute early. Good afternoon. My name is John Quigley. I am the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, welcome to yet another edition of the Governor's Pipeline Infrastructure Task Force. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, first, let me take care of the housekeeping. I uh, want to go over some points for your safety and comfort. Again, if we need to evacuate the building, the fire alarm will go off. Let's hope. It's happened to me before. Uh, please take your car keys and valuables and leave the building the same way you came in, out the doors at the back of the room, into the lobby, and left out the building's main entrance. Go up the stairs and continue to the top of the parking lot. Our assembly area is at the left half of the top row. Karen Yorty uh, of DEP will lead you there. If you need assistance or are unable to go up the steps, remain in the room until the others have left, and Heather Rhyme will either help you to the side parking lot or inform safety personnel that you're here and will return to wait with you. Uh, please don't operate cellular telephones or any other electronic devices in the event of an emergency. Uh, following, follow any instructions given by building safety personnel. They will be identifiable with their orange baseball caps marked safety. Uh, and then remain at the assembly area until the building safety personnel give it the all clear. Uh, please don't get in your car and leave. The entrance to the parking lot needs to be kept clear for uh, incoming emergency vehicles. Uh, turning now to your personal comfort, the restrooms are located off the lobby. Uh, go out the back conference room door, the one you came in, and turn to your right. The ladies' room is on the left, and the men's room is on the right. Uh, a water fountain is past the restrooms on the other side of the security doors, and we'll have someone there uh, in the lobby to let you in and out uh, through those doors. Uh, we will at some point have a short break on the agenda, but uh, as always, we encourage folks not to feel constrained. Uh, do what you need to do. Uh, with that, uh, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. And uh, we'll start with Sarah. Sarah Battisti, Southwestern Energy. Curtis Beyond Edge, TRC. Terry Bossert, Range Resources. Matt Wurst, I'm here on behalf of the Chairman of the Public Utility Commission, Gladys Brown. Dave Callahan, Mark West Energy Partners. Matthew Gall, rep are standing in for the District of Engineer, Colonel Chamberlain, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Keith Coyle, Van Ness Feldman. Kathy Cazone, Chester County Commissioner. Fred Delena, EQT Corporation. Denise Brinley, here on behalf of Dennis Davin, Secretary of the Department of Community and Economic Development. Chris Plank, DCNR. Mike DiMatteo, Pennsylvania Game Commission. Joe Fink, Cone Gathering. Alan Brenzer, on behalf of uh, Director Richard Fr Flynn, Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. Anthony Gallagher, Steamfitters Local 420. Nicholas Giannopoulos, Giannopoulos Representations. Mike Gross, Post and Shell. Mark Gutshaw, Land Studies. Sam Robinson, on behalf of John Hanger, the policy, uh, Secretary of Policy and Planning. David Hanovic with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. <coughs> Mike Helbing with Penn Future. Walt Hefford with Talisman Repsol. Tom Hutchins with Kinder Morgan. Cindy Ivey with Williams. <coughs> Christina George Schwartz, Apex Companies. Don Keel with the CETA Council of Governments. Bill Kiger with PA811. Ken Klimo, Wilkes University. Joe McGinn, Sunoco Logistics. Doug McLaren, Historical and Museum Commission. Uh, Dave Messersmith, Penn State Extension, Penn State University. Marvin Mateer, Wyoming Township Supervisor, Bradford County. Lauren Parker, Civil and Environmental Consultants. Dwayne Peters, ACEC. Mark Reeves, Rochelle. Leslie Richards, PennDOT. Heather Smiles, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. David Smith, PA Turnpike Commission. Michael Smith, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Steve Tambini, Delaware River Basin Commission. Justin Treadle, Rice Energy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you see on the screen before you the uh, important dates. Uh, we're on the home stretch here, but actually the work is just beginning. Uh, but uh, ask you to keep those dates in mind. Uh, what I thought I would do in, for my report this afternoon is to talk about the process that we are about to undertake. Uh, and I, I will say at the outset that I, appreciates, I appreciate everyone's ability to tolerate some level of ambiguity on this. Uh, trying to arrive at consensus when we have 184 recommendations uh, is no small task. But as I, I will try to explain here in a second, uh, I think we actually have achieved pretty substantial consensus, and I'll explain why. Uh, 
but first, I, I want to thank all of you for this extremely important work. Uh, these 184 recommendations that are contained in this draft report uh, represent some very thoughtful consideration of the implications of pipeline development in Pennsylvania. Uh, we clearly have a long way to go given the magnitude of the challenge to developing a strategic approach uh, around the subject, but I think we have taken a very strong step in the right direction uh, with this first draft. Uh, I, I'm sure that you know that there are those out there who believe that our work uh, is the best chance to create a world-class approach to pipeline development, and uh, that is a, a high charge, uh, and uh, I know that we're worthy of it. You've also heard uh, in our meetings, uh, the public comments, and have probably read already of some of the doubts uh, that have been expressed in some quarters about this work. And, and I want to say very clearly that prejudging the achievability of any of the recommendations before us, before they're even discussed, uh, is, in my opinion, a mistake and very unhelpful. Uh, and, and any way that you slice this, this report is not the last word. Uh, we're not expecting or suggesting that the members of this task force sign on to every jot and tittle, every comma and, uh, and clause. Uh, this is about uh, developing a set of recommendations that will be the subject of a lot of follow-on work. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, probably at the next meeting and how we envision uh, the follow-on work uh, to be mounted. Uh, but th this is a, a process around consensus and getting ideas on the table. This is not a wordsmithing exercise. And so I, I hope that relieves some of the angst that might be in the room uh, about getting language with, with, with laser-like precision. So let's talk a little bit about the steps today and in the weeks leading up to our submission of this report to the governor in February. Uh, 35 members of the task force have filled out the survey that indicates which recommendations you agree with, which ones you disagree with, and which ones you'd like to discuss. And that, the results of that survey are going to guide our discussion today. Uh, at the same time, the public is providing their input. We've opened a 30-day public comment period uh, that will close on December 14th. Uh, and every member of the task force and everyone in the public can see and read their feedback in real time on DEP's website by clicking on the e-comment button uh, on our main page. Uh, your feedback is needed, too, uh, by December 14th. Uh, but I'd like your feedback uh, as task force members about the content sent directly to Karen Yordi of my staff and not through the e-comment portal. So I want to be clear that we're communicating through Karen. Uh, we sent you a form that makes, we think, it makes it easy for you to comment, and we can talk about that. Uh, but we think we, the form that we sent will make it easier for you to comment on the recommendations and other content in the draft. And then starting December 15th, we'll consolidate all of your comments and provide a next draft for your review. And we will turn around a next draft by January 4th. Uh, I won't tell you how much work went into getting the first one out the door in record time. Uh, and I owe my staff uh, a great deal uh, for their support of this work. Uh, we'll also provide for you a draft letter for your consideration that sets out our message to the governor. Uh, that would be transmitted along with the report in February, so we'll have a chance to talk about that. Uh, task force members will ultimately be asked to sign that letter, so a preview of coming attractions. Uh, we'll meet on January 13th to review that next draft with the goal of sending the report to the governor in February. Uh, but as we have said so many times, it's not the last step. Our, our work will include a chart, and again, we'll, we'll provide a draft of that at the next meeting that suggests which agency ought to lead or be the lead for each recommendation. And the intent here is to implement what we're recommending or at least work out the details of what we're recommending. So we will suggest uh, agency leads for each recommendation. We'll include that chart in the next draft of the report. And we'll also be looking for duplication and we'll work to consolidate some of the duplication. And there was considerable duplication around things like mapping uh, that we'll try to boil down uh, for you. Uh, you can already tell that each of these recommendations will have to be analyzed to determine their feasibility, uh, the needed resources, the legislative or regulatory elements of implementation, uh, and then they'll require an imp implementation plan uh, if next steps are to be taken. Uh, at DEP, we're already looking at every recommendation that says or implies that DEP should. 
uh, will analyze the reality, the, the feasibility, the resources, and implementation of each of them. Uh, some of them, frankly, should belong to other agencies, and again, we'll talk about that uh, at, an, at the next meeting, uh, but some we think might be better placed than agencies that have the requisite expertise. Uh, the bottom line on our work is that no one agency owns the pipeline process or the outcome, uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to create the most coordinated federal, state, and local multi-agency process that we can before, during, and after each section of that pipeline is laid. So that's where I hope we can get we can all get to together uh, in this process. Uh, today's work, uh, I want to refer you to the survey results. Uh, I want to comment a little bit about the consensus that you expressed through the survey uh, that three quarters of the members of the task force completed. Um, and I want to walk through some statistics. There will not be a quiz afterwards, so it's okay. But for 123 of the 184 recommendations, more than half of you said you agreed. Pretty good start. Indeed, if, if we created a, a score uh, which sums the recommendations where you agreed or were neutral uh, and created a, uh, a consensus score, percent of total responses, uh, and if you add up where folks indicated they agreed or were neutral and then divided that by the total number of survey responses, 35, and looked at those percentages, here's what comes out of, of the effort uh, by committee. I'm going to walk through 12 of them. Uh, in agriculture, we had a consensus score on both recommendations uh, of 89% or above. Uh, conservation and natural resources, of the 26 recommendations from that work group, only six had a score of less than 50%. County government, of 12 recommendations, only four were less than 50%. In emergency preparedness, of 12 recommendations from that work group, one had a consensus score of less than 50%. In environmental protection, of 69, count them, 69 recommendations, only five had a consensus score of less than 50%. Uh, from the historical, cultural, and tribal work group of six recommendations, none scored less than 60%. Uh, local government, only one of the three recommendations scored less than 50%. Natural gas end use of five recommendations, none scored less than 69%. Uh, pipeline safety and integrity, 13 recommendations, one scored less than 50%. Uh, public participation, none of the six recommendations scored less than 57%. Siting and routing, nine recommendations, one scored less than 50%. Work workforce development, none of their six recommendations scored less than 86%. And economic development, none of the 11 recommendations scored less than 54%. And the remaining three recommendations, which were kind of multi- uh, multi-work group scored 66% or above. So I think I would submit to you that there is substantial consensus around the recommendations. And what we would like to do today to, to chart a path forward is to focus on the 13 recommendations where there was most disagreement. And we've sent, we've sent out those spreadsheets to folks. Uh, in each case, at least five members of the task force agreed. Again, we have we have a total of 48 folks on the task force, 35 whom, of whom responded, and we are starting with a list of 13 recommendations where five or more of you <coughs> agreed, disagreed. Uh, and we'll, as, I, as I warned <laughs> in an email earlier this week, uh, we'll ask the work group chairs for each of these recommendations to be actively engaged in the specifics uh, as needed. Um, just in terms of process, a process for a coalition report is, is not necessarily precise. Uh, we're, we're a body that represents just about every perspective on this issue, and we're now at the point of considering the details behind our overall goals. Uh, so as a reminder, we, we agreed at the outset of this little adventure that we would create a list of recommendations to reduce impacts, increase public participation, improve permitting, and ensure safety and integrity. So today and in our subsequent work and in your subsequent written feedback, if you disagree with any recommendations because it doesn't achieve one of those goals, please don't just oppose the recommendation. Uh, keep the conversation going by telling us what it would take for you to consider the recommendation appropriate for the report. Uh, we know that some of the recommendations are duplicative and we'll work to consolidate them. 
so that uh, we, we can get to a final number. If you feel strongly that you can't support a recommendation, we're prepared to add a note in that recommendation reflecting your concerns. Uh, that survey, that form that we sent out asking for your particular comments, we're open to the idea of including that as an appendix in the final document. But just uh, what I want to do is, as we start the conversation is remember this is not the last word. It's the beginning of a much longer term process that will lead us to a better outcome for Pennsylvania. So any questions on that before we start? Sarah. Um, now that we have a, an understanding of how you got to the 13 that we're talking about today, for those recommendations where we put um, more discussion, and a lot of those are high numbers, how are we going to address those? Because I think a lot of us, well, I won't speak for any, for me, I put needs more discussion uh, in order to have those conversations. And so when I'm looking through this, I'm just wondering what we'll do with those. Okay. When you look at the, the numbers of want to discuss, uh, it's pretty obvious to me that we could be here for another year or two, <laughs> uh, depending on the level of discussion, which is why we sent out that form uh, asking members of the task force to indicate on that form uh, what particular areas that you would like to discuss. I think we need to collect some more data uh, internally in terms of staff support so that we can structure an appropriate discussion. Because if we just start marching through all of the, all of the uh, recommendations where folks indicated they wanted to discuss without some sense of what the level of the discussion is, we could tie ourselves up in knots. So I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the timing and, and our ability to deliver a report to the governor, but I think we need a little bit more data as to the level of discussion that folks are looking for and, and maybe some of the specifics. So that was the purpose of the form that we sent out. Does that answer your question? Kind of. And follow up? <laughs> do, you anticipate, do you anticipate, given like the example under conservation and natural resources, which is the permitting standards of the duration of impact has 18, to further discuss. So hmm. clearly a lot of us wanted to have that, that follow-up conversation. I understand from our purposes and our timing, we need to move quickly. I think that if, maybe from my perspective, if I knew that those, though, if I said wish to discuss more meant we, we were not going to, I think maybe I would have answered differently. But in the purposes of timing, I get it. But um, you want more information. Do you, do you anticipate that being after January or prior to January? Well, we'd ask everybody to, to use that form that we sent out, let us collect that data, and see whether that's a, a pre- or post-January conversation. Okay. Uh, we just need a little bit more data and guidance. Okay? Yep. Denise. Mr. Secretary, a quick question for clarification. How will um, recommendations that were put together that are, that are already required under state and federal law be dealt with? I think we can flag them as already required, uh, and that's certainly, we can create, we can slice and dice and create spreadsheets or what have you, but I think it's a good suggestion or a good point that uh, there are some things that were called out in some of these recommendations that are in fact already required. So we can note that. Good suggestion. Other questions? Dwayne. I just want to back up what Sarah said, and I know going through, um, whenever a wish to discuss was put, there may have been one or two good nuggets of information that warranted a discussion, but overall the uh, recommendation may not have been feasible from a regulatory standpoint. So um, I know we're gathering information on the comments, but from our point with the timing, going through each recommendation and identifying those things is a little bit difficult from our end. So I'm wondering if uh, after the meeting some thought could be put into maybe perhaps enhancing that so if we break into the work groups and maybe have additional discussions or use a different kind of tool to get better information if that would be more valuable. Sure, sure. And, and frankly, Dwayne, we, and I appreciate both questions because we didn't want to presume too much. We wanted to get folks together and, and have at least the first conversation about what's in front of us to see how we can chart a, a reasonable path forward. Other questions? Senator. bills right now that answer and the very quest that, that reflect the very concerns in the report. So I think it's important that only to understand regulations that are out there that might have already either been in, that are in place, but also the legislative process and the bills uh, that, uh, that 
are in, that even before the commission came together have been put in. Some are in committee, some are in different stages of the process. So your legislative liaison perhaps could put all those together and be very helpful. Well, we'd be happy to work with your office. If you can help us identify those bills, uh, Senator. Yeah, no, being the author of the number along with Senator Rafferty, that's an easy task. Yeah, and we could circulate that information. Thank you. Excellent. So I think that one of the things that struck me about the report and probably struck everybody else, and you mentioned it, was uh, the degree to which uh, a lot of the um, work groups actually came up with similar proposals, uh, you know, uh, parallel evolution or convergent evolution or something like that. And so the, the thing that I, I, I would recommend, but I don't know how we can implement it because right now we're into a public comment period, is just the idea of, of reworking the document and then trying to combine those recommendations that are really duplicative of each other. Because I think once we were able to do that, then we could really get a sense as to the, the real number of recommendations that we have and then you know, do a better job of, of um, coming to grips with, with how we feel about them. Well, one of the things that we can do, Ken, is uh, in very short order, uh, get out to the members of the task force a list of the duplicates. And, and we had intended to suggest a, a, a way to consolidate the duplicates by the next meeting anyway. So we, we already started some of that process. So we can flag uh, the number of duplicates uh, for the members of the task force and, and get that out to you by email. All right, we're going to ask folks when you uh, when you want to speak, please identify yourself first and last name for the stenographer, please. Okay. Any other questions, Lauren? Uh, Lauren Parker. Uh, so after the public comment period closes, and based on our discussions today and our comments, uh, who is going to be making changes to the report between you know the December fourteenth into the January fourth? Is it the internal DEP work group? And as they make changes based on comments, um, I guess I would ask to make it easier for us if we could get a document that says what was changed um, so you can kind of track how changes were made and what changes were made to make it a little bit easier for us. And is that what you're anticipating yes. doing? Yes. I mean, the, the changes will be determined by the members of the task force. Who will actually do the work? Uh, sorry, folks. It's my staff. Uh, but we will have a track change version for you. Actually, we'll probably send you both. Uh, so get ready for your inbox to get loaded. Other questions? Dave. Dave Callahan. Um, I don't want to jump too far ahead in the process, but you mentioned uh, the department would be going through some sort of a feasibility analysis. Could you talk a little bit more about that in terms of the recommendations and the, the feasibility analysis that you're going to go through on them? Or That, Dave, will not be done for purposes of the report. The, 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 the meat of this is going to be what happens once the report is finished. The report isn't worth anything if it's not implemented, if it just sits and gathers dust. So the, the follow-on work after the report is delivered to the governor and digested from the, by the governor's office is for us to develop work implementation plans. And part of that implementation plan is, is some level of feasibility analysis by the lead agency. So that, that is all post-delivery. Go ahead, Lauren. I have a follow-up question to my one earlier. So Again, um, name again, please. Lauren Parker. Every time. Just to clarify, um, are you anticipating that the 12 work groups will be making changes to the, our recommendations or the DEP internal work group, like your work group, will be making the changes? The changes will be directed by the task force. And the individuals who will be actually going into the Word document and making the changes will be DEP staff. Joe again. so when you say the, the task force, so it would go hypothetically, so agriculture is at the top. So any comments or changes would go back to the agricultural work group. They would input them at the work group level. No, the, the work groups are done. Okay. The, the work from here is the task force, the, the folks around this table. Okay. So, so uh, Joe, sorry, Joe McGinn. Um, the, so for the task force, so again, with the agricultural, even though there's zero disagrees, but using that as an easy hypothetical. So when the task force does it, just, I guess, who? Because it's a, kind of looking for additional direction. So who, who takes that up, or is that something we determine today? Or? 
Well, I, I would suggest to you, I mean, you used agriculture as the example. I don't think there's any work to do there. Well, Nobody disagrees, so it's well, done. Well, as far as down, I'm concerned, it's done. Yeah, right. So, go, well, I just picked that one because it was the first letter in the alphabet. So right. conservation and natural resources. Right. So hypothetically with that one, how will that work? Well, we are going to talk about the, the top line uh, areas of disagreement and hopefully wrestle them to the ground today and decide how they will be handled in the report. And then whatever is agreed to around this table will be inputted into the final document by a DEP staff person. Okay. Right. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. Okay. Mark. Uh, Mark Gutschel. Follow up on uh, Ken's comment. Um, it would be helpful as well um, where there's duplicative um, recommendations by the task for or the committees if they could also be ranked by if there is like three or four of the same. So we know as we're looking at it what the group actually saw as a priority if it was done multiple times. Sure. Other questions? I just, I, Sarah Battisti, I just have a, a follow-up. Um, so the ones that have wished to discuss will be discussed after we d to decide implementation plans. So in February when we decide what the agriculture example, um, especially the one that got 15 wish to discuss. I'm just, so we won't have an opportunity to change that between now and the time it goes to the governor, but we will have an opportunity to discuss it once the implementation plan has been put in place? Well, well I, not necessarily. We, again, we sent out a form that I hope everybody received to solicit your comments that would inform how we approach the wish to discuss column. So we need some feedback from you now by filling out these forms that we can take a look at. We're actually pretty good at DEP in, in taking a lot of paper and synthesizing. It's kind of what we do in public comment periods. So we need all of you to indicate the areas that you want to talk about each of these things. So give us some data that we can look at and make some sense of and come back to you with a suggested process of how we will handle the wish to discuss this. Denise. One more follow-up on that, Name, Mr. Please, Secretary. Please, Denise Denise Brinley. <laughs> Sorry. Denise Brinley. <laughs> Just one more follow-up on that. I, I think if I'm hearing you correctly, anything that is on these forms in white, not yellow, but white, will automatically go into the report unless we synthesize information back to DEP that we want to discuss what we want to discuss, and we'll hear about that after the fact. Well... Because I, I think there's some confusion, and to be fair, when I put something in the wish to discuss column, it's because I couldn't determine whether I disagreed or agreed on behalf of DCED. And right. so it, ma it made it hard, really, to make a decision in those two columns. Okay. And I, I would suspect that there are a lot of people around the table that are feeling that same angst, okay. that we're well, leaving some things tabled that mean we might w otherwise not want to be tabled. So the purpose of the form that we sent out to everybody is to tell us what you would like to discuss about each of these recommendations so that we can figure out an approach to, to capture all of the conversation. So that was the purpose of that form that we sent out. Tell us what you want to discuss about each of the recommendations that you have flagged. That, that's what we're asking for. Now, does that make sense to folks? Do, do we understand the assignment? We, we have to capture, again, 48 sets of wish to discusses and then try to make sense of it and have a process that works. Walter. Walt Hufford. Mr. Secretary, that's pretty clear. I just want to um, let you know that when we submit our comments on that form, we would likely change our vote if the, if the document stands as it is without the ability to discuss. We, we will put in there that if we can't change it, then we would likely oppose that recommendation or we may support it. But the whole idea of discussing was to try to come to some resolution. So we'll file the form, we'll annotate where we think there's some issues with, with the recommendation as it's written. Right. Uh, and if, if we can't resolve that recommendation, then we may oppose it. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Tom. So Tom Hutchins, <clears throat> just to make sure, we provide those forms by the 14th. 
you'll synthesize that data and then send it out back out to us saying, hey, we'd like to have a conference call to discuss this specific one or at the January meeting, these are the ones that we'll discuss based upon your comments. Is that just process-wise, is that kind of what you think will happen? Yeah, we will play back to you once we have your forms, we'll analyze the data and then suggest uh, a way to address them. Now, whether it's a series of conference calls, uh, my, my supposition is I seriously doubt, given the number of just looking at these numbers in the wish to discuss column that we can possibly do it in one meeting. Uh, so we have to look at what is the most efficient way to wrestle some of these things to the ground, and that's why we're asking for some additional data. Because I, th very frankly, if we went through these 184 recommendations one at a time, and we just did a wish to discuss and had a conversation about each one of them, we'd be here till about 2018. Uh, Matt Worst. Mr. Secretary, uh, we're talking about that, that form you guys sent out on wish to discuss items. If there's an item that we're not going to address around the table, but w there was a potential opposition, would you also be looking to see those filings, those papers, to uh, kind of maybe put into the end work product so well, that opposition gets voiced? If, if there are any expressions of <laughs> oppose that we are that you feel compelled to, um, to provide for the public record to provide that justification, will create an appendix in the report. Thank you. So we're, we're not looking to, to whitewash or paper over any uh, substantive disagreements or issues. Uh, and again, we want to have a conversation with you, uh, since this is really evolving in real time here, uh, about how we best reflect all of the input of the members of the task force. So if it's a series of appendices, so be it. Uh, it, we'll, we'll go with whatever the, the group feels comfortable with. Other questions? Okay, not seeing any. So let's, let's try this. Let's see how it works. Uh, what I would like to do is, is take the discussion prioritization spreadsheet. Now, I don't have, mine are all in shades of gray, which is probably a really bad metaphor. Uh, but what I would like to do is start uh, with uh, the first item under conservation and natural resources, and that is recommendation number nine, require post-construction monitoring for five years. Now, that is contained on page 60 of the report. So if you can follow along here. Uh, so the, again, it's recommendation number nine under conservation and natural resources, require post-construction monitoring for five years. Uh, I will open the floor uh, to concerns, wish to discuss, Let's see how this goes. <laughs> Who would like to start? Chris. Uh, Chris Plank. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, regarding the title for this, I, I do want to point out, um, this, this came from our work group, uh, but the title ind uh, indicates four or five years. And that was not uh, the actual intent of this recommendation. The, uh, if you read approximately in the middle of the paragraph, it says, for some resources, the results of any impact could be obvious much sooner and specific time periods can be established. So somewhere in the editing, the title was changed and four or five years was appended to the title. Uh, the important points for this uh, recommendation is to monitor for an appropriate period of time. And uh, the other point um, that is important is the project should fund the monitoring. So I just wanted to clear up that uh, five-year uh, indication in the title. Okay. All right. it, I thought that was sort of misleading. Okay. All right. And that, that could have been, that could have been my fault, personally, my fault. Because uh, I tried to help maybe too much, be too helpful to my staff in kind of coming up with some simple declarative sentences that captured the essence of each recommendation. So that could be my bad, Chris. Uh, but n now we have something that we can chew on a little bit. Given that clarification, what other questions, comments, concerns? Dwayne. Dwayne Peters. Uh, this is a really excellent one, I think, to lead off the discussion. Because I think generally one comment is the fact that the way that this uh, recommendation is written, the word uh, infrastructure is used. I know this task force is centered on pipelines. However, a lot of these recommendations have the potential to impact all type of construction projects. 
I think it's very difficult to focus just on pipelines, especially if it's any kind of build out. And I think the reason a lot of us put wish to discuss is the potential to impact other development type projects and how that would affect other industries and businesses within Pennsylvania. So with that said, I, I think it's something we should all think about as we look at these recommendations, how they would impact outside of pipelines. Uh, okay, uh, uh, reaction, questions? Ken. All right, so Ken Klimo from Wilkes University. Um, uh, I actually don't want to respond to, to that one uh, concern, although I think that that, it would be a va that that is a valid concern that I think we would really need to think about. Um, I think that this one uh, recommendation, I think, embodies uh, several recommendations that are out there that I think um, uh, met with, you know, some, some degree of, of disagreement uh, among, um, you know, among the, uh, among the people on the work or on the, on the task force. Uh, and specifically, I think what we were getting at here was the idea that we're trying to construct or we're trying to develop uh, best management practices, and the question is, how do we know if we're successful? And, you know, certainly in education, one of the things that, that we always have to look at is something called assessment, and we always have to assess our students, assess our own teaching skills, and, and figure out, you know, whether what we're doing is actually benefiting others and, and whether we're meeting our goals. And I think in the case of, of um, doing these BMPs, uh, we have to have some independent measure of whether um, what our intent is is actually being fulfilled. And the way that this happens is actually by, by doing monitoring, by doing some science. Um, again, I think that science is, is a very important component of this. And so I think, I, you know, I was glad to see actually that, that um, under Conservation Natural Resources that they came up with similar proposals to what we came up with under environmental protection um, and so, again, the, the, the purpose for this is to come up with assessment, because if we don't assess what we have or what we're doing, we really don't have anything. So that, that's the impetus for why we want to do this. All right. I'm, I'm going to ask others that have expressed disagreement with this to uh, please weigh in. Lauren Parker. Um, so my initial concern was the five years. So the clarification makes me feel a little bit better about this. Um, and I think that post-construction monitoring, I support that. But I think that we already have that in place. Um, you know, there's already long-term operation and maintenance that is required for stormwater BMPs and, um, you know, structural stormwater controls. There are requirements that the Army Corps has for after 30 days after construction, as well as one year after the first growing season to do monitoring. So again, I think there's things already in place. Um, I do have concerns also with this about um, it kind of being open-ended that, you know, I, you know, they should, you know, who establishes how long it goes? You know, so the five years isn't a one size fits all, but who decides how long it should be? And how does that happen? Is it each individual agency? So I think there's a lot more to this that leaves it quite open-ended. So I've, I still have some concerns. I feel a little bit better based on the clarification, but I still have some concerns. Okay, well, and here's, this is a good example of, of how I think we need to be approaching this. Again, we're not writing a, a regulation here. We're not writing a piece of legislation. We're writing a recommendation that will, by its very definition, require a lot of further detailing in an implementation phase. And again, that's the whole purpose here is to tee up work, further work that will extend for quite a bit, quite a long time, well beyond the, the life of this task force, certainly, in some cases, years. So in terms of the level of specificity here, uh, I, I want to encourage folks, uh, if we have any prayer of getting a report to the governor by February, to, to consider it in those terms. This is teeing up a broad recommendation that will absolutely need further work on feasibility, on regulatory authority, on needed legislation, uh, on budgets, on resources. So uh, just please try to keep that in mind and through, viewed through that lens, what we want to identify here is uh, can we uh, re resolve the substantial disagreements and, and at this meeting, today, this afternoon, uh, bless this in some way. 
And that's ultimately what I would like to accomplish today. So I'm, I'm interested in, in any comments or feedback on that score. I'm Matthew Gall, uh, Corps of Engineers. I wanted to respond to that last uh, point that was made regarding duration of monitoring. I think what we've, we've sought in our permitting is to, to find whenever, you know, when a site or a crossing, uh, water crossing, water body crossing, has been restored to pre-construction condition at least in terms of the impact to the aquatic resource. So I think if, that, if, if the permittee can demonstrate that it's been restored to, to that condition, we're, we're satisfied. So that, that would put the limits on, on how long that would, would occur. Okay, other discussion. Changing the title to require post-construction monitoring period. What other concerns or, or objections do we have? And we're not trying to have a vote here on each one. Again, we'll never get done. We end up like Congress. So I, I want to avoid that if we can. Dave. At the risk of uh, being accused of wordsmithing, I just have a question for the, the, the working group about the, the use of the words um, flowing streams in the project vicinity that may be impacted. So are we only talking about those that, are, that we're crossing, those that are nearby? Can you help with that, please? And again, Dave Callahan, I'm sorry, Mayo. Yeah. I don't know, Chris, can you maybe amplify on that? So, so the, um, it's important to follow the premise and the concept rather than the specifics. The, um, s some activities require varying lengths of monitoring. And, and I think the, um, this re, uh, recommendation mimics to a uh, great extent what we do on state forest land and on uh, for many federal projects. We go, uh, we monitor our ac activities and disturbances on our lands for a longer period than perhaps uh, the permit might require. For example, a permit might specify 70% um, uh, you know, when you reseed, you need 70% uh, ground cover, right? So there's often times where uh, if you come in after that's already been approved as 70%, there might be some failures and it might be reseeded. Those are the sort of uh, issues we're trying to get at with this BMP. Does that make sense? Any other questions, discussion? Uh, Mike Tomatio with the Game Commission. I'd just like to add in terms of monitoring, um, many pipeline companies oftentimes have to do some wildlife enhancement for both, you know, Game Commission species, Fish Commission species, such as wood rat, things like that, and that longer term or a period of time to monitor the success or failures of those particular um, enhancements certainly is needed and, and, and recommended, and whether it occurs on private grounds or public grounds. So that kind of flexibility in this recommendation is, is necessary. And again, to the point that Denise raised, there are obviously agencies that are already doing this. So th this is not a de novo kind of a thing. So the concept here is in responsible pipeline development to require post-construction monitoring. Are there any real objections to that? And I'm at the speak now or forever hold your peace point of the conversation. Again, this is, this is a, a broad recommendation that in order to be implemented further would require follow-on work by an appropriate lead agency, however they would want to mount that work, stakeholder group, whatever. So this is not, again, this is not the last word. This is a, a construct. So I, I'm asking if there are any, are there any serious objections, again, given the fact that only six folks raised this as a, as a disagreement, to uh, including it in the report with the change in the title? Peters. Uh, the only thing I would like to see clarified is a section on the cost and who pays the cost, what that means, what the liabilities and things of that nature. I know it's a little bit of wordsmithing, but it could have huge implications in terms of expectations following the uh, publishing of the report. But would that not be part of the follow-on work? It would, but these are the kind of things I think um, 
the expectation part of what is coming out of the task force should be clarified before it hits the streets in order to set the stage for success of the group. And, and we will, in fact, we will draft, although we've talked about it, we will, how about we do this? Uh, we will draft a, a statement or a preamble, I, I'll take a DEP word, but a preamble to this document that, in, that tries to capture the essence of this conversation, that uh, there are a lot of details inherent in each one of these recommendations that need to be worked out, that these are, broad, in fact, broad recommendations that need a heck of a lot more work in order to be implemented. Would that make you more comfortable? Yes, thank you. Uh, just a little clarity, and I think sure, that's all. Sure, sure. I, I, again, really appreciate everybody's willingness to tolerate this kind of a process, this kind of consensus-driven approach here, uh, and not getting to voting mechanically on stuff. So it, with that, are there any other objections to this recommendation? Mr. Secretary, Walt Hufford with Talisman. I'm looking at the first paragraph, considering that the title was confusing for many of us when we read it, uh, the sentence, a standard period for post-construction, I realize this is wordsmithing, um, for monitoring five years from the established completion of the report could be taken out of context. And I'd like to think that we could maybe amend that, that the appropriate agencies should look at what an appropriate time would be instead of putting a, a, dead, a date in there, like five years. I think that just sets in place an expectation that may be incorrect. Well, if we modified the title to say required post-construction monitoring for an appropriate period of time, does that get you there? Again, I, I, I will say very honestly that if it, if it comes down to a 47 to 1 vote, I, I am not inclined to, to torturously go through a wordsmithing exercise. So again, in a broad construct, does making that change to the title get you to a comfort level? Go ahead. Uh, Lauren Parker. I think we're gonna run into the same issue on all of these. So I don't know if it, I, you know, I, I know a ton of work went into writing out, you know, everything that's listed up here, the full recommendation, justification, challenges, but I don't know if, I know for me, I think sometimes I would be more comfortable with being that it is just a general broad recommendation that requires a lot of follow-up work and you know future efforts to try to figure out how to work it. I feel like we're saying it's very broad, but yet we're providing very specific information. And we're gonna continue to talk about wordsmithing of this sentence versus that sentence. And I don't know if we can try to just make the report more general knowing that we have this information that we can then take the next steps on. I don't know what anyone else thinks, but. Well, let me react and then, then to Sarah. Uh, I, I will be honest with you that my personal opinion, I don't want to water the work down that the work groups have done. Uh, this is exemplary language. It's, it's providing an example. The standard period for post-construction monitoring is five years. That's a simple declarative statement. Now, you can read it three or four different ways. And it, if we are going to spend a lot of energy approaching this document in that way, we're never going to get done. So I, folks need to kind of take a breath here and, and realize that, again, this is broad. <laughs> these are broad recommendations. We can try to tweak these a little bit here and there. But in a preamble document, we will try to capture the, the, the gist of this conversation that words and details do matter and when it comes to the implementation of any of these recommendations. Much more process is required, much more discussion. This, this is the start of a conversation for Pennsylvania. It's not the last word. So again, I, I want folks to, to try to stay in that kind of a space as we approach this work. Otherwise, it's not gonna happen in February and, and the governor expects a report in February. So th does that, Address any of your concerns, Lauren. <laughs> Senator. Listen, this, having gone through many task forces and seeing the Sorry, results, okay. all we're doing is incorporating what everyone said. We all have different points of view. Some represent companies, some represent private practices, some represent counties or cities. 
And ultimately, the reality of anything is going to become either in the development of regulation or the development of legislation. Uh, and so, uh, and when the regulatory process emerges or the legislation emerges, there's hearings, there's definitions, and all the, what, how it will ultimately look and be is going to be determined then. It would be impossible, I think the Secretary's point is, it would be impossible for us to do what in any piece of legislation takes months and months. Usually the hearing process, the debates, and in the regulatory thing, we can challenge regulations if we don't like those regulations, but that's not the purpose of all this. So I think no matter where we are, whether we're an active environmentalist or a member of a company, we have to understand here was a group of people who represented various points of views, and they put down a series of recommendations. And, and this, as the Secretary said, is simply the first step in what hopefully will be a very robust and intense dialogue within the Commonwealth. Because, uh, and, and an important step. Because understand that not one, that the profit from the Marcellus Shale industry is going to be dependent on whether it gets to the marketplace. And the way it gets to the marketplace is going to be through these pipelines. We don't even have intrastate regulation. We're only one of two states that has no regulations within the state. So we have, uh, so for example, we have legislation to give that to the Department of Transportation, for example. I'm just saying that most of these issues are on the cusp of regulations or legislation. And what's so helpful here is to see generally what the questions we should be looking at are, rather than try to answer each question individually, which we can't do. Right. Thanks, Senator. So I think Sarah. we all have to be tolerant of each other. I mean, I read the, I have a lot of things I don't like. But, uh, uh, but the, uh, and I'm sure each of us do, and a lot of things we think are great. But ultimately, it's simply an initial step that raises the questions. And I can't think of any regulation involving the Marcellus Shale or pipelines or any piece of legislation that's not going to really get debated and fully discussed. And, uh, but, if, but who's going to raise the questions? What the governor simply is asking us to do, what are the questions? What is it that we should be looking at? And that's precisely what the secretary is trying to get us to do. So I would say, rather than the objections to something, in fact, I would argue that th those, those very issues which you have the largest number of objections to are the very issues that we have to put in the report because we have to discuss them if we're going to resolve all this. All right. And again, we will show this work. We will, th all of this information is going to be baked into the final report. So are there any other questions, comments about this one? Dave. Dave Callahan. I remembered this time. Thank you. Um, I, I guess for me, and maybe some of my some of the folks around the table can weigh in as well. I guess for me, in looking at this, are we saying post-construction monitoring is important? It's, it's a good goal. I think everybody can agree that in the right context, yes, it is. Or are we saying there's a need for more? I don't know if that's, if anybody else has that threshold question, but that's kind of running through, running through my mind. Sarah. Sarah Battisti, um, to Lauren's point, to the Senator's point, to Dave's point, um, if we're going, if this is the first step, and we're going to talk about wordsmithing, and we're going to talk about the importance of being general because we're going to have further conversations using words like require and some other definitive terms that put us all in the position of, well, you said we need to require this. I think for those folks around the table who are considering that we were going to have longer, further discussions together as a group puts us in uh, sort of a quandary of, okay, do we say, yes, we approve this, and then how do we... You know what I'm trying to say? Like, I'm, I, I think that there's, there's issue with that for all of us, for all of these recommendations that we want to have conversations about. And then you get into the details. Well, you all agreed to this, so you must back it now is my concern. Well, again, any fair reading of this process and the charge that the governor has given us and the language that we'll put around what I'll call the preamble uh, will show that that's not the case. And that, that's a simplistic reading. The other side of the coin, very frankly, is 35 folks filled out this survey. Six disagree with this recommendation. So simple majority rule, we shouldn't even be having this conversation, very frankly. 
So the, the purpose here is to strive for a, a conversation and consensus. Uh, and we'd like to get everybody to a comfort level around all of these. But we'll, we won't get there if we split hairs, <laughs> very frankly. Again, all of this is going to require a lot of follow-on work. And, and we can craft a, a preamble to this document that doesn't commit everybody to every single word in the document. And again, folks can express their specific concerns. Uh, we sent that form out for that purpose. Uh, if we need to do something else in terms of either signatories or some other document that is included in the final report to the governor, we can do that. And, and I'm certainly open to that conversation. But and I think given the, the numbers here, uh, a, a real straight process would be there's not a whole lot to talk about at all today, but we don't want to approach it that way. So we'd like to get everybody to a basic comfort level uh, with the concept here, and again, with the assurance that we will provide and, and we will together wordsmith a, a preamble to this document. Terry. Uh, Terry Bossert. Uh, I appreciate those comments about the preamble um, because I think it for me, it resolves a lot of these, and I'll go to an easier one, which is the next one, which says full-time inspectors every five miles. I have no trouble with full-time inspectors. I don't know whether every five miles is the right number or not, so mm -hmm. I put down need to discuss. So I think with that preamble, at least I feel, you know, better that I can react to the concepts and not every, every word that's in whatever the, the backup right. material would right. be. Thank you for that. No, no, thank you. Denise. Denise Brindley. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'll offer an amended title to hopefully move this forward. Implement appropriate post-construction monitoring. Leave the rest as is. Any objections to making that change? I, I'm going to ask Chris, does that still capture the essence of the work group? Chris Plank, uh, yes, I believe that does. Okay. All right, I'm going to stick a fork in this one. Denise, thank you for the recommendation. We're going to change the word required to implement. All right, we're going to move along. Let's see how it goes. The next one, uh, conservation and natural resources number seven, implement full-time environmental inspections during pipeline construction. That is found on page 57 of the report. And hate to have you on the hot seat for the first go around, Chris, but uh, any words of wisdom on this one? I, I will, let me start off by saying that uh, this one, the relevant agencies listed at DEP, uh, and here's how we would approach this. We'll just kind of game this out. If this goes into the final document unchanged, and then DEP, as the responsible lead agency, sits down to develop an implementation plan, my first question is, I don't have the budget for it. So very clearly, in terms of ana analyzing feasibility, there's not a prayer doing this, absent an appropriation from the General Assembly. That, that's part of the, the analysis of this and, and probably some other uh, recommendations. That's not to say it's a bad recommendation, but the reality of the situation is, uh, unless the EP had a very, very significantly enhanced uh, appropriation, we couldn't do this. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be in the report. So again, even though this on paper assigns me an impossible task, I don't have any heartburn with it. So again, that, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I, I thought I'd offer that comment. So Chris, I'm sorry I cut you off. That's all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I think with this recommendation, it's again important to uh, look at the premise and the concept as the important point and not get into the details. We did our best at, at trying to um, write something specific, but not too specific. But it's the premise and the, and the content that's important. And I, so what, what this uh, recommendation is trying to say is uh, disturbance activities need sufficient inspectors. The, the recommendation expresses a concern over uh, the number of boots on the ground we have to do inspections. 
And then at the end, it, it uh, expresses a concern over how we pay for that. So in, in essence, I, I know there is, um, it looks somewhat specific, but those are the, the broad questions that it's asking and getting to. And um, for things like um, construction or road projects, oftentimes ins uh, consultant inspectors are included in the cost of the, the project. So perhaps something like that could be uh, implemented. And that would have to be done likely by regulation, which is a whole other process. So again, this is the, the concept here. So discussion, questions, concerns. Ken. So again, Ken Klimo from Wilkes. Um, so one of the things that actually confused me a little bit about, um, about this recommendation was, uh, I, I guess it was implied, but maybe not made explicit, that, that there would be, that the um, oversight would be done by somebody from the DEP. Uh, certainly the pipeline projects that I've been on, they, they generally do have some kind of a compliance person uh, who's there. And uh, again, whether that compliance person uh, is, you know, it, you know, whether there's a conflict of interest in there or not, you know, certainly there shouldn't be a conflict of interest. But uh, was it the intent, I guess my question is, was it the intent of the, uh, the committee that we're specifically talking about a DEP person to, to serve this role, or could it be somebody else? It, uh, the way the, the recommendations went, written, it alludes to a DEP employee, but we, uh, um, an alternative might be a, a consultant that worked for DEP. Dwayne. Dwayne Peters. Uh, the, there's a couple of things, and hopefully make this a little bit more helpful and go through, given the budgetary, is the construction inspection and environmental inspection culture is one of uh, somewhat of a nomad existence where people travel from project to projects. They're typically uh, independent consultants assigned on the companies for the duration of the project. So keeping anybody busy for a length of time is hard and perhaps using a, a contract to have an on-call service and modifying this to have properly trained DEP staff just to oversee and maybe do spot inspections to make sure all the compliance and uh, regulations are being followed could be helpful. There's some uh, great guidance documents from other states that lay this out. Uh, there's also, this wouldn't certainly apply to the FERC projects that have the third party independent environmental inspectors, but it could certainly shore up and probably there's regulations that clear this up and quantify. But I think a little bit, again, getting into wordsmithing um, could, could get this through. And the intent isn't to take up time, but provide solutions, I think, in the discussion here to help some really good examples pass through properly. So. If, if you need any help, there, we have a lot of resources at ACC that we can provide um, to the department to help clear that up and give good, solid examples of where that works. Right. And again, I, my thought is that this is kind of, this falls into the follow-on bucket. Again, assessing the feasibility, taking this recommendation and translating it into something that's actionable is going to require quite a bit of work and, and analysis. Uh, from a, a variety of perspectives. So, again, if, if that's at all helpful, uh, this is this is a, a, a general generalized recommendation that is that sets a certain direction, and that's how we would approach the task. So, any other questions? Uh, Joe McGinn, a, a question for Chris or the committee. So, you had brought up uh, road projects. So, is this something that's that's done, for example, in building a new roadway or 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 some type of other infrastructure that isn't done on, for pipelines currently? So uh, my understanding is that, um, for example, PennDOT might include in the bidding of their project some cost for consultants to do uh, monitoring uh, during the construction phase. I know in DCNR, when we do construction contracts, we include inspector cost in those projects. Okay. I see hands raised in the audience. Folks, we're not taking questions from the audience. This is for the task force. The public comment period will come afterwards. Any other questions from the task force? At the end of the meeting, at, at, check the agenda. Any other questions from the members of the task force? All right. 
I would just say I thought the clarification was helpful when folks were talking about company inspectors who have the ability to, you know, monitor what's going on and shut down activity in addition to DEP makes a lot of sense in terms of that. That helps add some clarity. All right. Any other discussion? Any heartburn if we move on? I'm not seeing any. All right. We will turn then to number eight from Conservation and Natural Resources. Monitor water quality during construction. And that is on page 58 of the report. Who would like to start us off? Any folks who indicated a disagreement? Okay, I'm hearing none. Go ahead. Joe McGinn. Um, one of the questions in terms of the language on, on page 58, and just looking for further, um, I guess, input from the work group, but it talks about um, uh, under justification of the third paragraph, general lack of information regarding effectiveness of, of BMPs. Is, a, is that, am I reading to that, it's kind of unknown how the project goes currently or that there's an issue with the current um, uh, water quality monitoring practices? And then the, the follow-up, and I, I, Joe McGinn, that I would just jump in here is now with the ENS permits that we currently have that regulate kind of the impacts and discharges, um, is that what this is targeting or would it be something in addition to that? So, so the, um, the recommendation is looking to employ some basic measures to pick up ENS or surface water issues. Uh, that would otherwise not be uh, noticed or captured. So it's, it's a enhanced monitoring. And it, it calls for involvement of, uh, more involvement of the company with the hopes that uh, this improves um, innovation and um, techniques and practices. I mean, go ahead, Senator. And this is something that's very important. We just went through this, for example, with the Delaware River Basin Commission, who came out with a system of monitoring. Uh, we, uh, we then provided them with new approaches to monitoring through, through, our, uh, through Stroud Water Resources, our own Chester County uh, Water Resources Authority. And ultimately, into that plan now, into the new docket, is the new approach to monitoring. So to assume that only that 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 every type of water uh, shed or what you're dealing with is different ge geologically and uh, and in all other ways. So to encourage alternate approaches uh, to water monitoring to keep up with the science is something I think you would all think is very positive. It, what we're trying to say is we we want to expand the p possibilities and. And we could debate whether what works or not. And, and after, uh, actually, after three sessions of DRBC, they agreed with us finally that, that in this particular situation, a new approach was important in terms of water quality. And this dealt with a well and, and its impact on a stream. But it would be the same, uh, uh, I would think. I think this is an excellent, uh, excellent approach. I don't see a problem with it. Okay. Then Laura. From Wilkes. See, the thing again I want to point out is that um, this also then overlaps with uh, number on if you go to page four of the um, <coughs> uh, of the survey, uh, it, it overlaps significantly with number 47, conduct con uh, quantitative site monitoring, and then also with uh, number eight, develop standard water quality monitoring practices. This again would be one that I, I would see would be. Um, you know, would have to be would would, would be uh, um, synthesized, and, and we'd come together on this one. Um, I think that one of the things that was a little bit different, maybe, from what we did on the uh, the, the environmental protection work group, which interestingly didn't meet with as much um, disagreement as this one does, is that we actually, um, in addition to looking at uh, construction during monitoring, we also proposed 
that there'd be a post, you know, both a pre and post monitoring uh, effort that would that would go on as well. Now, whether it would occur at every single watershed or every single stream crossing, um, you know, again, that was left open for discussion. But I think that as we look at uh, the various recommendations that are similar to each other, we put them all together, I think we might get a really good comprehensive <laughs> picture that will emerge. Lauren. Lauren Parker. Um, I think a concern that I had based on what you had said, Chris, was that it sounds like is the concern or, or should the recommendation be more that we need to evaluate our current BMPs because there's a concern that they're maybe not functioning properly and that's why we're doing the water quality monitoring because that's sort of what I heard that maybe the BMPs aren't functioning the way they should be or as good as they should be. So maybe, you know, maybe it should look more at improving BMPs to advance technology and how we're doing construction, not necessarily you know, that, that we need to improve our water quality, um, you know, how we do the water quality sampling, but more the BMPs that we have to use and advancing technology and BMPs. I, I would say that would be a, a correct assessment that um, some, some way to make sure we're seeing where there's uh, things that don't fail or things we can do better. All right. Any other questions, suggestions for clarification before we move on? Okay. Let's move on to the last one, conservation and natural resources. Chris, then you're off the hook. Uh, number two, develop public access to pipeline GIS information. Uh, that is on page 49 of the report. Who would like to start? Joe. Uh, Joe McGinn. Uh, Mr. Secretary, this is, the I think, probably of all of the ones that have multiple recommendations, I think the mapping is the most significant. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know the best way to, to solve it, but there's, you know, not a, a clear conflict, but there's a lot of different thoughts and ideas in terms of where mapping is. And the other piece is what level the mapping is. Um, so at a national level, you have the NAPI, national and National Pipeline Mapping System, um, and there's certainly you know other folks that, that would need that information. So I don't know the best way to do it, but I don't know if there's any way to to kind of merge those comments and find out what the recommendation would be from the, the committee, because there's a lot of different sources where this is going um, to, to kind of handle it appropriately, and then yeah. what the goal of the mapping is. Right, I, I agree. I think there was probably six or seven <laughs> different recommendations that touched at some level on the need for uh, GIS mapping. So I, I, what I would suggest is that when we come back uh, for the December meeting that we will somehow coalesce all of the recommendations relative to mapping into one document and hopefully at that point we'll have a, a suggestion on a, on a path forward. Does that make sense? It, it does. And the one other suggestion that I think will be a point of uh, that needs to be ironed out is there's the existing obviously pipelines as well as planned or or under or ongoing construction or planning. So I think, you know, it, there's probably, it's, it should be important to clarify each of those. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions or comments from the task force? All right, we will move to uh, county government. Uh, oh, sorry, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Mr. That's Chairman. Okay. Uh, and I apologize for being late. So my question is because I was late. Um, there are some items which you probably already covered that are not highlighted in the yellow. So hmm. there might have been some concern in terms of discussion, and I assume you're not going to have that further discussion on those that are not highlighted. Well, we are trying this out, Madam Chairman, uh, to identify the areas that had more than a majority, or more than, I forget what the percentage was, but at, at least five, actually it was a number, uh, if there was five or more members of the task force who responded, and 35 members of the task force responded to the survey, uh, if five or more dis expressed disagreement, they're the ones that we flagged. So anything less than that, we have not teed up for a conversation. Is there an avenue for, and, and, and the reason why I say that, in some cases the PUC may be able to give you some technical support in terms of areas that are already addressed, whether it's in our regulations or federal regulations. Is there, is there an avenue for us to be able to give you uh, written comments in terms of what we want to discuss? Yes, we sent out a form uh, yesterday uh, with, that is asking for exactly that information. And, 
we did fill out the form, but I mean for everyone to Yeah, we, we are going to compile those forms at DEP and then come back in some way that I hope will make sense for additional conversation. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to move to county government. Sir, please sit down. Folks behind you can't see. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about the folks that are behind you that can't see. So I'm asking you to please sit down so everybody can see. Thank you. All right, county government. Uh, recommendation number nine, uh, require shared rights of ways. That is found on page 103 of the report. Who would like to start us off? Mr. Secretary, if I might, Kathy Pizano. Sure, Chairman. I'm sorry, Chair of the County Government Work Group. Um, I think on its face, the short title um, is probably maybe a little bit too short. And as you could perhaps tell by the full recommendation, there was a great deal of discussion in our work group, um, and there are a lot of qualifiers in that full recommendation. Um, uh, for example, um, we understand that, that not everybody will have the opportunity to be able to uh, co-locate, that there are different standards among operators, and that operators might have some concerns or, or concerns that include business competition, among other things. However, we felt very strongly that it was an option that should be explored, um, and that's why we included words like, to the extent possible, um, and further uh, indicated that we believe that any requirement should include a maximum number of pipelines, regardless of the product, in any single right of way. So I don't know if any of that information helps address uh, whatever the concerns might have been relative to this particular recommendation. Well, Commissioner, would you want to suggest, not to put you on the spot, but I guess I will, uh, a better <laughs> title? And I'll take the blame for this one. We could perhaps take the word require out of the title and um, uh, consider opportunities for shared right-of-ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Given that change, uh, any other questions? Joe? Joe. Um, under environmental protection, I think number 17 has a shared right-of-ways one, so they're, they're very similar. So again, it's, and it's, an, it's an example of that. The yes. other thing I think to be sensitive for, for, this, for this topic is the different varieties of pipelines you have in terms of the gathering, transmission, distribution, and that it's, it's kind of hard for a one-size-fits-all box in some of those. Well, we tried very hard to not make a box yeah. <laughs> in this recommendation. Yeah. Other questions from the task force? Okay, Chair Madam Chairman. Uh, mine's not a question, but a statement on this. This is uh, number nine for the county recommendations. And I'm glad we're changing the word require because um, we wanted to point out that in terms of uh, electric and gas rights away, th there cannot be the sharing of those type of rights away. Uh, the concern being that the electrical fields from the power lines would neutralize the cathodic protection for the gas lines, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? All right, let's move on. Number seven under county government, develop advisory standards for pipeline setbacks and buffers. Page 101 of the report. If I might just briefly comment again, Kathy um, the, uh, the the conversation and the thought that went into this was um, for the state to develop um, either model ordinances or advisory standards that <laughs> municipalities uh, could use uh, in their planning. Um, beyond right-of-ways, any new type of pipelines except distribution lines should be required to have a buffer or setback from existing development and new development around existing pipelines should be required to adhere to establish setbacks and buffers. So it was kind of a both ways. Uh, we intended to make it uh, both ways. Um, we also recognize that um, consistency across counties um, and municipalities uh, would be important, and so our recommendation was to ask the state uh, through its many agencies to perhaps come up with uh, these uh, ad advisory or model ordinances. Questions, comments? I have Dave. a question. Um, Dave Callahan, Mark West. I, does this contemplate then zoning per se for, for pipelines? Because I think there's a lot of discussion 
it could be had around this table uh, about that particular topic that I think a number of us in the industry aren't all that supportive of. But and, and, and I can consultative discussion on, you know, setbacks from pipelines versus for pipelines could be, you know, another topic for discussion. Well, I think, I'm not sure if I understand your question completely, but I think that's exactly what we're trying to do here, um, was to talk about the setbacks on, from, from development and from pipelines. Um, so I, I don't know that that answers your question. I think it does. <laughs> and I think, okay. uh, I think we, we have some areas of concern there that are being discussed in any number of levels throughout the Commonwealth and yeah. local municipalities. But, Center. But it's a uh, Andy Dinnerman, But it's a good thing to discuss. I mean, we see the uh, the um, tension right now between municipalities and whether it be the PUC, whether it be uh, who has the right to do eminent domain, whether it be other agencies, is who has control over the zoning of pipelines. Uh, it's a sub question. Uh, you know, for a township in the Commonwealth. That is their, one of their most important powers. And so, and if you're going from township to township, it's actually in the industry's interest that there be some consistency. And I think, uh, Commissioner Cazone can tell me if I'm wrong, I think what they're asking for is that consistency. But again, we're not making a decision of who has the right, but you can issue or you cannot issue a report without recognizing that this is one of the uh, key issues right now being debated in the southeastern Pennsylvania, and, uh, and a great deal of tension uh, is, uh, is occurring as a result of that. So we at least have to say it's worthy for discussion. Other questions? It does go Name, against a you, little, oh, sorry, Sydney Ivey. Thanks, um, in the first recommendation of shared rights of way, um, if there is already existing infrastructure in place that a particular company would want to expand, that could go against, that goes sh using shared right of ways, but may go against buffers because of encroachments in already existing rights of way. And Ken, uh, Ken, did you have one, and then Dave? Yeah, I, I guess just uh, uh, asking for a point of clarification. Um, when the county government made these, uh, you know, ma made this request or made the recommendation, uh, were you looking at mainly um, uh, uh, potential conflicts with with built areas, or were you also looking at things like natural features, wetland, watercourses, things like that? In this in this particular discussion we had, we were talking very specifically about residential commercial development okay. on the one side and pipeline development on the other. Okay. And again, the idea was to establish um, uh, advisory or, or model language that municipalities could use when they're having these conversations uh, with the pipeline operators in their communities. I mean, like right now, a lot of municipalities don't have the resources to even be able to, to have some of those conversations. All right, so on and if basis, we were to do it at the county level, and this is kind of where the conversation came up, then there could be a lot of inconsistency among counties and therefore municipalities. So our thought was if there were some higher level um, recommendations that would make for some consistency throughout the Commonwealth. Okay, and so the way I would respond then is that um, this, this might superficially then seem like an overlap between your recommendation and then Environmental Protection's recommendation 19, which is also flagged. But now that you've clarified it, I, you know, this would actually not be a, an overlap between the two. Okay. Okay. Dave. Good. Yeah, I assume. I would just like to recognize that there is considerable legal debate um, all over the Commonwealth as to whether municipalities uh, at any level can zone for pipelines. Correct. I would say for a certain subset of us, uh, of the pipeline industry, um, those of us who do not have or currently have the power of eminent domain, it's virtually impossible to say you can go there uh, if you don't give us the power to go there. Uh, all of the pipelines that, that are of the gathering variety rely exclusively on the willfulness of the property owner to allow uh, a pipeline on that property. And I think that, right, folks, and that please. Is their, that is the property owner's right to say yes or no. Hmm. Other questions, comments from the task force?
Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Uh, for those of you who are following along, we are at item, item number four on the agenda, continued discussion, uh, after which we'll have public comment. Uh, so where we left off, where we left off is under county government, number eight, amend municipalities planning code to empower county comprehensive plans. In your hymnals, please turn to page 102. And again, I, I will take responsibility perhaps for some of the, the language here. So if, if uh, some issues with, relative to the title, we can fix that. But who would like to start the conversation about this recommendation? Terry. All right. Uh, Terry Bossard, I'll start with a question um, to see if I really under, understand this. Um, is the intent here that if the county comprehensive plan, for example, would say at some time in the future, this part of the township or county will become commercial, even though it's farmland now, that that would be uh, used as a way to determine whether pipelines could be placed in that area? No, that was not our intent. Okay. Then... How would the county comprehensive plan tie in with pipeline um, location? So what what the group the, what the consensus of the group really is, and, and where this uh, particular recommendation came from, is that um, you know every county is required to have a comprehensive plan. The municipalities are uh, participate in how that how that plan uh, is implemented, and there is a process by which uh, development plans get reviewed through the county planning commission. Um, there is not the same process nor the same consideration for pipeline development as there is for other kinds of development. Um, what this generally comes out of, and that most of the themes in the county work group. Uh, recommendations uh, related to communication and transparency um, very often and while I, I, I recognize that it at its very core um, at least for many pipelines it's a landowner decision uh, the constituents have questions their first uh, question goes to their municipal representatives who then call the county um, and nobody seems to have any information on what's happening. And so there's sort of this vicious uh, cycle of communication. So the idea was that if pipeline development were considered like other kinds of development through that process, that would be helpful um, in the communication process, um, not only uh, through municipalities and to our constituents, but quite frankly, uh, including the operators as well. Follow-up, Terry? <laughs> Does that get your question? Or we need some more clarification on this one? Uh, yeah, let me just follow up uh, Terry Bossard again. Um, so I'm sure if I understood, would a pipeline plan then be reviewed just like any other land development plan? Yes, and then um, in, it would be identified through the county as consistent or inconsistent, which is not, you know, is not a, um, doesn't, the county is not empowered to say you can or can't do this, but it would identify the, pro the, the project as consistent or inconsistent with our land use plans. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments? All right. Seeing none, we're going to move on. Uh, the next item that we have flagged for you is on page four of the spreadsheet under environmental protection. Uh, number 47, conduct quantitative site monitoring. Public page, the public will be heard at the end of the meeting, just public as the agenda says. Please we back have, off. We have 10, All right, we're going to ask, comments. officer, would you please remove this individual? Yeah. across the state. You are finalizing your recommendations. 
on this task force without having heard from the public. All right, we're going to ask you to sit down one last time, then we're going to have you removed. There is a public comment period at the end of this meeting, and that's when we will have it. You will not be finalizing these recommendations without hearing from the public every single time. Officer, would you please take care of this for us, please? Every single time that you are moving forward with these recommendations without hearing all of our public comments, you are silencing the voices of Pennsylvania. All right, let's move on. And that's why we have a public comment period. No, with all due respect, we have an agenda and we're asking everybody to be civil. We're asking everyone to be civil and to allow this process to work without interruption. There is a public comment period. I'm going to, Maya, I'm going to ask you to wait for the public comment period. I'm going to, whether you agree or disagree, that's the rules. Can I just ask, when will you hear from us? There is a public comment period at the end of this meeting, just as there has been for every single meeting of this task force. There is a public comment period open right now that you have the opportunity to weigh in. That's why This we're here. group needs to do its work. And the public needs to do its work in the, in the time allotted. So I am going to ask one last time for folks to please be respectful of this process and the folks around this table and the public, the audience, all of whom have a right to hear what's going on. We want to proceed in an orderly fashion to do our work. And if not, I'm going to ask the uh, Capitol Police to remove anybody who continues to be disruptive. And we are concerned that you're removing the public. I am coming. We're concerned that you're removing the public from this process. And we simply ask for the opportunity to be heard before you solidified your decision making, which is clearly what you're doing here and now. We've had four days to Officer, please. All right. All right. Now, Item number 47, for environmental this protection. This is wrong. Page 177 of your hymnals. Uh, Democracy is messy, folks. It is what it is. Uh, conducting quantitative site monitoring, page 177. Questions from the task force? I will just point out, uh, just in terms of observations, uh, that the idea of, uh, the idea that's suggested here uh, obviously needs some additional work. In, in terms of our permitting, for example, under Chapter 102, uh, the permit terminates once restoration is achieved. So there's some uh, some questions in terms of how this kind of an or recommendation would be implemented that would have to be uh, further developed. But uh, I'm particularly looking for folks that uh, disagreed with this recommendation to speak up. Tom okay. Hutchins, uh, Mr. Secretary, and <coughs> We just needed more information. I mean, it's unclear exactly what additional monitoring they're talking about. There is already some monitoring required, so it's hard to judge this recommendation based upon the information provided. Okay, is Haley here? I'm, I'll ask Haley Jeffords and my staff to step up and maybe answer that. Hello, my name's Haley Jeffords. Um, I was the chair of the Environmental Protection Work Group. I do th see how um, uh, while simultaneously specific, we are also kind of general in this full recommendation, but the intention was for um, restoration monitoring, and I think that our intention here was really to assess um, the monitoring that is currently required and to probably expand upon the current monitoring requirements or see if that would be an efficient and effective use of, um, of resources. Other clarifications, other questions? Yeah. Terry. Uh, Terry Bossert, I think this one, in my mind, goes back to a comment that Dwayne made earlier, and that is, you know, earth moving is earth moving, whether you're burying a pipe or building a building. So I'm curious whether there's, whether this is supposed to be just for pipelines, and if so, what would make it unique for pipelines, or is this something that's the department wants to consider for all earth-moving activities. 
Well, again, this isn't uh, coming from the department necessarily. It's coming from the work group. Ken. All right, so Ken Klima, I think if, if, if we could address that, um, certainly a lot of times when you build buildings, you don't necessarily uh, build them within wetlands or water courses. And so, um, uh, and also there is a, you know, a, a, a paved surface and there are standard um, uh, ENS measures that are in place. We recognize that that's also true with, with pipelines, but we felt that, that um, you know, with the number of stream crossings that are coming in, and especially either the ditching or the uh, subterranean directional drilling, um, that again, to uh, verify uh, the efficacy of the, um, uh, of the best management practices, again, it just seems that, that, that doing post-construction monitoring is something that, that would be a very wise thing to do because it gives you a solid basis then for understanding whether there is or is not an impact. perfect sense. I mean, it, uh, 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 any pipeline is going to cross over so many streams. And, uh, and we've debated that. Uh, and we've worked it out with various companies, uh, you know, explaining our sensitivities and, and getting it done. But the other thing is, you, when you go through suburban areas, you literally have, it's literally no bigger than this area be, be, be where the houses are, you know, and, uh, and, and it's not even defined sometimes. When we go to find out what the right-of-way is, uh, you go, it, it, when you get into the 40s and 50s, when some of the original gas lines are there, you don't even know clarity. It goes underneath people's decks. So to be careful how you move the earth is very essential. It's different going through the Philadelphia suburbs to get to Marcus Hook, and we all want you to eventually to get there if, you're go if we're gonna get this product to market and create jobs, but you have to be sensitive to the environment that you're dealing with. And I think that, is that what you're trying to say? I mean, in Franklin County, it's one thing, but when you go through the, the developed areas where the housing is so close, and you're dealing with old lines and putting new ones in, it, it, it has to be done in a sensitive way. Uh, and I believe that's part of what you're trying to say, is it not? We were trying to be sensitive and just acknowledge the impact that putting a pipeline in has in that it's a right of way usually between 50 to 75 feet and it impacts a large strip of land and we want to ensure that proper restoration occurs because there is a high risk of sediment and erosion that can be somewhat unique to these projects in just the breadth of their impact. In essence, Mr. Secretary, and the gentleman again, if I urge the industry, if you want to achieve your aim, everyone understands the economic viability. You're going to have to have that sensitivity going through our suburban areas in terms of the environment and water runoff. No one wants to be your enemy. No one wants to put up the barriers. We understand the economic health that comes from this. But the, but, and we can argue all the science and the fracking and everything else. But you simply have to be sensitive to what our constituents feel is going in their backyard. And part of how you move the earth, part of the impact of water runoff, uh, all of this plays in. And, and I urge you to at least encourage that discussion because you can't create the partnership which will allow you to create the economic success for yourselves or the Commonwealth without that discussion taking place. And I think that's what you meant. Uh, and because it's very different depending where you're going through. Dwayne. Secretary Quigley, uh, getting back to the recommendation is, this, this looks like really good language for a special condition on a permit, uh, especially with um, some of the seed mixes and movements we've seen with planning for pollinators and special seed mixes, it necessarily wouldn't apply to an area working with a property owner that might want that to be reverted to an agricultural or a yard type use. And in the spirit of Denise Brindley, maybe we could just modify the title to say where appropriate. So if it is something that requires a special seed mix as part of the permit conditions, there's protocols in place in which to ensure the success of that plant. Is there any objection to that? Okay, we, we can add where appropriate to this title. 
Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, seeing none, we're gonna move on to under environmental protection number 19. Establish setbacks from wetlands and water courses. Uh, it's a little bit of a repeat, I think, here to some level. Uh, page 146. Would like to start us off. And there was about uh, five folks that expressed this agreement. I'm interested in hearing what the disagreement was about. I'm not seeing any takers. Mm -hmm. uh, Twain, go ahead. Joe McGinn. Or Joe, sorry. Um, the, uh, I guess the first, in terms of a question to and clarification, so increasing from the 50 to 150. Um, again, you know, all development, all construction, pipeline specific, and then um, I guess what, what's the thought behind the specific 150 and even, you know, the perhaps 330 in terms of distances? Um, the supporting material that we provided here, which came from the Nature Conservancy. And again, I know that the specifics here uh, might be a little concerning and there, there is room for debate on the specificity, but um, the overall goal here is to assess the protections needed for waters that are beyond just the stream banks, because we do know that in Chapter 102 permits, there is a 25 foot minimum distance and it's based on, um, I believe it's stream banks. And we wanted to try and pull in more waters and just to highlight the sensitivity that we need in development to the waters of the Commonwealth. Other questions, Terry, did you have one? Any other questions? Go ahead, Dwayne. Dwayne Peters, just one clarification. So uh, really we're talking about a regulatory change in which the jurisdiction of the department would be for areas without floodplains would increase from 50 feet to 150 feet. Um, sorry, I'm, the specificity again, I'm not sure what your question was. I thought you, so could you repeat? Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but for uh, streams that do not have established floodplains, I believe uh, from bank is 50 feet jurisdictional area in which you require a permit. So this would be for cases in which there is an established floodplain or if there is an established floodplain that's within that 150 feet that GEP would take jurisdiction outside of that area. I'm not sure that I can adequately answer your question right now um, because I, do think that it's going back to keeping the recommendation broad and to having actually our permitting experts look at this and come up with their recommendations. And as you can, I believe in this one, we do note um, that it doesn't match the 25-foot distance. Um, we probably could have done a better job of acknowledging the need for further study and research that might need to be conducted that might be issues to address. One more follow-up. Uh, the way, reason I read into that is because the use of the term approved encroachment. Um, I'm reading into that this would also be an encroachment if that needs to be approved. So maybe that's something we can clarify and take a look at um, for the next round. Go ahead, Lauren. And I'll, I'll chime in because I was on the committee with Haley, so I can add a little bit to that. But um, and I. I, I do think that's what we, we were saying. We were saying, you know, currently the department does regulate within 50 feet, and I do think that this is pushing it to have a to have more regulation of regulating areas larger than just the 50 feet from top of bank. Um, and also, you know, currently there aren't any setback regulations <laughs> or any encroachments, setbacks for wetlands. It's currently just the wetland itself. So this is also adding um, additional. I would say authority or regulation of the department to setbacks on wetlands as well. So I think that this would require a lot, um, you know, some regu regulatory changes in order to enforce this. So Tom, Tom, Tom Hutchins, did we look at what core and FERC 
requirements are today to be try to be consistent with them because I mean there are setback requirements that if the core has jurisdiction what they are and for for water body crossing same thing I don't I don't have them right before me but just to where we're consistent do we evaluate that element uh, Matthew Gall, uh, Corps of Engineers uh, we do not require setback from wetlands or waterways if if there is a discharge of fill in, uh, material into the wetland or the waterway, that's when a, a, a need for a permit is triggered. So I, I hope that answers your question pretty simply. David Hanovic uh, with FERC. Uh, we do have uh, standard setbacks from wetlands and stream crossings for workspace. So there are uh, examples for FERC regulated projects. Some other comments? Questions? Joe McGinn, I, I, just a comment for this. I think it gets into when you look at the county and local government, the complexity of, of kind of siting and building new infrastructure, trying to balance. And you look here, trying to expand the buffers from wetlands or streams, and then also trying to balance it with where, you know, uh, residential development is um, and, and kind of getting it's not a direct conflict, but it's a squeeze and it's certainly a challenge for developers of projects. Mm -hmm. One that you know, I just wanted to highlight. All right. Any other discussion? Can, Commissioner? Can I just respond to that? And that was a, a big part of the discussion we had in the county work group. Um, but to the comments I made before and the senator's comments earlier, what we're really hoping to foster, at least from the county government work group and for all the recommendations so far, is better and more communication between the operators, um, local governments, and the constituents. And so, you know, I think that we recognize that maybe there's, you know, we don't want you to do it here, we don't want you to do it there, but what we want to have is a conversation. And, and I think in many ways, and I don't want to speak for that particular work group, but some of these are conversations that we're not having. And if I may, Mr. Quigley, I think uh, Commissioner Cazone, uh, who also is from Chester County as I am, is trying to help not hurt uh, what's going on here. That you have, that the, when you're in a highly urbanized area and you're in a county like Chester who has spent millions and millions of dollars to preserve their natural resources, one-fifth of our land is now preserved forever as natural open space, our citizens are demanding of us that we protect those rivers, protect those streams. And, and so what we're trying to work with the companies in saying is work with us, communicate with us. In the end, we, everyone could, in some ways, have your cake and eat it too. In other words, it can create the jobs. The product can get the market. We can argue all about fracking, whether it's good or not good, but as long as it's still legal and there's a product, unless you talk, unless you communicate, uh, unless the citizens feel they have some input in that, and the input is through us, we can hold, you can say it's gonna be held up. I mean, an example. When one company uh, we held up for several years because of the crossing of the stream, who since then has been good, I mean, has understood our culture much better, the next company comes in and says, says to us, we'll do the stream crossing the way the citizens want because, and we'll pay the extra money because we don't want to be held up going to market. The only thing a public officials can do right now, and the public can do, is to hold you up. And that takes away from the economy and jobs. But if you really start to discuss these things and work with us and get qualified people that Mr. Gallagher has here, we can solve all of this together. And I think that's what Commissioner Cazone and the Commissioner's Group has. That's what I added on to the public participation is our desire to find the way. And that's why the discussion of each and every one of these questions in a true dialogue, right now all we do is we go at each other uh, in between, because we have to defend our constituents. Can't we find a way, and because we can't walk away from that question of protecting the rivers and streams and, how, and protecting people's houses on either side. Our citizens will not allow us to walk away and we have a responsibility not to do it. But if we can figure out a way to do it with the industry with their knowledge, with the uh, various uh, interest groups, we can solve these things. And I think that's what, I, I, that's what Commissioner Cazone is trying to say to you in a very articulate way. 
Other, go ahead, Lauren. Um, Lauren Parker, could we just maybe consider changing the title? Um, and I'll speak to some of my other cohorts that were on the group with me, but to maybe instead of establishing setbacks, maybe consider saying uh, the department should evaluate the need for setbacks, or something like that. Uh, please, please wait till the public comment period, folks. Uh, I, I, I won't put the pressure on you necessarily, <laughs> Haley, unless you want to take it. Uh, but it has that language change sound. Evaluate the need for setbacks. Well, I guess evaluate, evaluate the current setbacks, you know, evaluate the need to change the existing, you know, setbacks that are currently there. Or how about evaluate existing and needed setbacks? I think that that would adequately capture or evaluate. accurately capture our intentions. Evaluate existing and needed? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that? All right. Not seeing any. Uh, we will go to... Mr. Secretary. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm Walt. I'm sorry, Walter. Didn't see you. Thank you. I just had one question for you, um, and it's probably not significant, but there's a lot of environmental NGOs that do great work for what they do, and we're referencing the Nature Conservancy here. Do we have to actually reference them? I mean, there are so many people having input into this. I, I'm just a little worried that putting this out s seems to me like an endorsement of what they're doing, and they do great work. I give them money. But I'm, I'm just wondering, does that, do we actually have to reference an environmental NGO in this recommendation? Well, again, that's, that is the, one of the bases on which the work group submitted the recommendation. So I, I, I think omitting that, it loses some very important data. And, and again, we're, we're going to talk about a preamble here in, in terms of uh, how this report is to be construed. Uh, and. I think this was cited as an example. I don't think it was excited, cited as the final word. I Haley, if you want to amplify. That, um, they had published a document full of best management practices suggested for, um, for shale practices overview. And I think that we intended this to be this was a good example that we had seen that was in, we thought should be examined as possibly appropriate for the Commonwealth. And again, I think that might be one of those steps that continues after the report goes to the governor and we start to trying to, we start trying to implement them. Does that adequately address your question? Ken. Yeah, so Ken Klimo. So again, as one of the people who actually wrote this, this uh, um, recommendation, um, uh, basically I, I, I agree that, that we probably should have looked at, you know, more examples. I think, again, you know, from a scholarship point of view, we probably could have dug a little bit deeper and, and realizing, though, that this is a first crack at it and not, you know, we're not coming up with any final recommendations or anything like that. I think that any, uh, and I would hope that any um, either... Uh, um, you know, uh, um, uh, improving of, of this particular recommendation or as it uh, would come into law uh, or, or regulation, you know, certainly you'd have to look at a whole bunch of other, um, you know, recommendations that are out there. But I do agree that this is something that it's current, it just came out, um, it, it, uh, it, it, it provides some, some really good information. So I think that was what compelled us to try to include at least that, one, that one there. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, number, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Mike Tavadio with the Game Commission. Just wanted to know what that war group uh, meant by specifically designated waters. Were you looking at like just HQ or EV streams or, or certain Chapter 93 designations? Or is that just kind of a... I think we were trying to capture uh, HQEV streams. Okay. Yes. You may suggest a, a language change in we there. We could be more, be more specific in that regard. That. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> Environmental protection number 29. Develop plans for no net loss of forests and headwater watersheds. Page 
Dave? Yeah, I just had a, had a question or request for clarification. Um, if this was intended merely for this industry or other developers, or because there are plenty of other industries that develop land in this manner. When I advised my work group, um, the discussion was solely focused on the pipeline build out, um, just for clarity purposes. And I don't think that, I mean, we did not have discussions as to applicability to other industries during our discussions. Thank you. Dwayne. I think we should discuss whether or not this one goes forward, just given the implication to private property owners who want to develop, build houses, increase their agricultural developments in and around first order streams. It seems like it has a huge amount of trickle effect that could span across different sectors as well as private citizens. Any other questions, comments? Again, this is, again. That it is controversial, that it does need to be discussed. And, and how could they discuss other areas when the task force mission was clearly stated, you're only to look at this in relationship to pipelines. But the point is, the very controversy means that it should be listed as a question that the group raised because and you're, and you're right. I mean, no one, uh, in fact, in the Senate when we were debating uh, things like uh, the buffer areas, the whole question was protecting the stream versus private rights uh, to use that stream. But that's the issue, and that's what merits the discussion. And, all, and if you listen to what the Secretary said, he said, bring the questions up that merit further discussion. And that's certainly one of them. And again, the vast majority of folks that responded to the survey agreed with with this recommendation. Go ahead. Mike Helping, Penn Future. I just wanted to also add that this doesn't necessarily prohibit any development in first um, in first order headwater watersheds. It also allows for compensatory mitigation. So it, it does allow for, even if it were implemented as described here, it would allow for other ways of working with those areas. Mike Helbing. Steve. Yeah, I mean, there was a little Steve, bit of detail. Could you say your name for the? Uh, I'm sorry, Steve Tambini with the DRBC. Certainly, there was a little bit of detail provided in the BMP related to first order streams, but at its core, the issue here was that forests provide uh, a benefit to watersheds, and certainly, at tr what what the BMP talks about is identifying what's the highest value landscapes in forests that potentially could impact watersheds. Identify what it is, and then work towards avoidance, uh, um, minimization, or mitigation. And there's a lot of work that would have to be done, but at its core, it's just a start of the concept in the relationship between forests. The highest value, again, it's not a blanket over, over all forests, but the highest value, identifying what those are. Yes, the word first order stream was put in there, and certainly, you know, as we were going through the work group, the level of specificity was, you know, not, not perfectly clear. So if you read further, there was discussion about, hey, we need to do more research in terms of what are the highest value uh, water resource landscapes, and then work to protect those either through avoidance, minimization, or potentially mitigation. For, on, for this particular task, sure, the, the, the task force group was related to uh, pipeline infrastructure and other infrastructure. Just one Point. more comment, Secretary Quigley. Uh, I would recommend going for future, uh, forward with this recommendation that we investigate the Ohio um, water uh, and stream um, assessment protocols and some of the challenges that they had in that state with a similar type of effort. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? All right, we're going to turn page. We will now move to page seven of your spreadsheet under local government, number three. Uh, allow local regulation for surface facilities. Maybe we'll get some bite on this one. Uh, page 226 of the report. I'd like to start. Go ahead, Marvin. Marvin Mateer, uh, Wylissing Township, Bradford County. With the local government work group, I believe what the intent of this is is to uh, exercise our responsibility to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of our residents. 
as well as uh, work through the provisions of the Pennsylvania Municipalities Planning Code. Uh, basically, this comes down to our, our zoning ordinances. We're not looking to uh, change the location, I believe, of the pipelines, et cetera, to provide for a compressor station, which is probably the first and foremost of a surface facility. Uh, what, what our intent here is, is to uh, regulate those, those items that we regulate on all of the other kinds of uh, structures uh, in, in our municipalities. Uh, basically, uh, this comes down to uh, noise, lighting, emissions, uh, traffic, you know, all of those uh, items that apply to, again, all of those other kinds of things that are regulated by our zoning ordinance. That was, that's our intent. Uh, be glad to hear any questions. I just have a comment. Uh, Keith Coyle from Van Ness Feldman. Any of these provisions that relate to um, a municipality establishing safety standards for regulated pipelines, are, they're just unlawful. You just can't do it. Um, there's preemption under federal law. It's very clear. Even if you cite the regulations in your ordinance, you could never enforce those. So just something to think about. Lauren. Um, and I'll just ask a question, and I might not realize. Um, are, are local municipalities not currently able to regulate service facilities? Because I personally have worked on a couple stations, compressor stations in local townships where we did have to go through a land development process. So I thought it was already in place, but perhaps it's not, or maybe it depends on the type of facility. I think there's, there's, there's two issues here. One is that we can take it back. We have a recommendation on communications as well. Uh, communications early and often, as I think we heard in one of our presentations, uh, if, we, if, we, if we carry that out, then that probably really helps this, this particular issue here. Uh, the other thing is, in, in most cases, uh, what you're saying you know, works very well for those municipalities that have, have zoning in place. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of municipalities, particularly across the, the northern tier of our state, that have no zoning. And it's, it's kind of a, a, a typical uh, assumption that if there's no zoning, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to. And uh, I think that's where, where some of this becomes a problem. So would the recommendation maybe be more clear to say, you know, I don't know if there needs to be funding to help the municipalities that don't have zoning to create zoning? Because I think that allowing local regulation, is ar it's already allowed. I don't know. Well, I, and I agree with that. And I don't have a problem, problem with that. And our, uh, our philosophy in developing uh, uh, our recommendations here was that even if it's already allowed, it doesn't hurt to say it twice sometimes. And we have a lot of those in the environmental protection, too. It's not clear when it comes to intrastate. Uh, you know, FERC takes care of interstate, but when you have lines as the Mariner Line, uh, that it originally was under FERC, then when, in, then when the facility was moved a bit into totally into Pennsylvania at Marcus Hook, um, uh, we don't have any clear regulations. Uh, we're not under FERC. Uh, uh, you know, and so the clarity on intrastate lines is, is I think, one of the things that's missing. Uh, and the question, I mean, if the PUC declares, just as FERC limits this, the PUC can determine, as they have in Mariner, that it's a public utility, and thus the township doesn't have any control over any of this. So that's one of the problems is just some clarity to the question that these townships are facing uh, and, 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 and to have a discussion of that. Sure, my understanding, this is Lauren again, is that this is related to surface facilities, not pipelines. Yes, and that's okay. the problem. The, the, the issue is, 
Uh, it was in West Goshen Township when the PUC decided that uh, that Sunoco was still a public, the Sunoco was a public utility, is who has jurisdiction over the building of a, of a uh, not just a compressor station, but a building in which other things would be in and a, and a stack that goes up and into, but I'm not describing this well. Uh, but, but the facilities, the township assumed it did, but once it was, de once it was declared uh, a utility, they no longer had that authority. So it's, it is helping the townships know what they have a right to do under the law and developing that law in relationship to the non-FERC uh, pipelines and even in the gathering lines, which, which there's very little, uh, uh, which is what the, small, the, the more rural townships face too. And so it's not the pipelines, it's the structures that are absolutely essential as the compressor stations, as the, and when you deal with uh, butane and protein. Remember, you're not just dealing with natural gas. You have the stuff coming the other way now from the west that isn't natural gas. It's broken down. What exactly can a township do in, a, in an intrastate or in a gathering line situation? Let me ask Commissioner Brown to weigh in. Um, thank you. Um, what I was originally going to say during this discussion is that we have concerns with this recommendation in terms of, because uh, uh, we, the PUC, has uh, gas safety jurisdiction. So uh, we have it in areas in terms of, uh, of course, the distribution lines, the gathering lines two through four in terms of the classes, as well as the intrastate transmission lines one through four, but then I heard Lauren say something that it wasn't dealing with the pipelines, it was dealing with the surface facilities. Is that, I thought I heard you. That, that is what I said, but okay. it was, it's, uh, it's Marvin's recommendation, so he can clarify what, I think that's what it was going at, because it says surface facilities in the, in the title. It does, but then it talks about where, where uh, if a pipeline does not have the certificate of public convenience. Right, <clears throat> we were looking at this as the pipeline coming to a compressor station, and compressor station may be only one thing. We don't know what other for, uh, surface facilities may be related to that pipeline. The pipeline comes out of the ground, goes into the compressor station, or <clears throat> however it's constructed. Uh, it's a very necessary part of that pipeline, and that's why, why we've conclu uh, included that. I can ask for, you were going to jump no, in, Keith. No, 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 go, please. <laughs> Keith Coyle, Van Ness Feldman. I just want to be clear on the interstate and intrastate gas or hazardous liquid. The municipalities for regulated facilities, whether it's regulated by PHMSA or it's regulated by the PUC under the Public Utility Code or Act 127, if the surface facility qualifies as a pipeline facility, like a compressor station, the municipality cannot regulate the safety of that facility at all. Like, there's case law on that. I just want to be absolutely crystal clear that that would not be an enforceable requirement. Unless the legislature decides to change that. And I didn't say that for a clause. I say that simply for the question that, again, it's a question that our municipalities are asking. What are their rights? What are, what, how much do they have to, how much do they, can they have a say? And, uh, and so all you're doing again is, uh, you have a local government group. They raised the question. I, 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 you know, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, we assume, for example, under Act 13 when it was passed, that the, that the state had the right to establish zoning. The court then says that's not a right that we have. That right rests, uh, rests with the local municipality. So this issue of what a municipality can do or not do is really at the core of a great, much, a great deal of discussion, not only in the, in the legislature and in all of the associations, the township supervisors, the, the borough, uh, super, this borough, whatever they call this, uh, uh, municipal officials uh, group. And so again, it's, it's a question. Uh, uh, and, uh, and again, uh, you know, what the law says or what the legislation says, uh, um, again, it's a question we're going to have to deal with because all the townships are on us on this question. All right, Keith. If I could just follow up to Senator Dinneman, 
the preemption that I'm talking about is under federal law. So mm -hmm. if you want to run for Congress and, and no, try no, that, but, 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 but the but state legislature could not the impact state this legislature provision. has a right into the state legislature has certain rights which we give to the PUC, which you represent, to protect us in terms of uh, of our safety. And if there uh, and and certainly NIMSA has a say, but there but the question remains: in a matter of public safety, what does a legislature do? If nothing else, it could pass a resolution that it appeals to the federal, that it, that, it, that it demands that NIMSA come in for a discussion, and we come to some conclusion. So the notion that I'm not running for Congress, and the notion that, that there's some, that federal preemption is, it, we accept federal preemption. We're not happy with it with FERC because of many of the things that have happened to us. But at the same time, uh, when you're dealing with a question of fundamental safety, this state has some responsibility. And, uh, and that's what, and, and we are not just gonna sit back, is what I'm trying to say, and it's the question. Maybe the question is we should simply sit back and not challenge federal law. Maybe the question is we have a responsibility to do so. And what the supervisors are saying to you, here they are on the local level. They have, and they represent the people. The federal government, the state government is telling them constantly what to do. And they simply are asking the question. For us to just, and if you want to come up with the answer, well, we, uh, that, uh, we just uh, don't ever challenge the federal government through a legislative process or through resolutions, fine. But at least it's a question to deal with is all I'm saying. And all I'm saying is if we're going to have an honest conversation about it, that in my opinion, and I think the law is pretty clear on this, that if, if you want to change the circumstance, you would have to do that by changing federal law that you couldn't do that at the state level? Um, actually, you can. Uh, if, if the states that have agreed uh, to any type of compact come together and agree to end that compact and then get the federal government to agree to that, we can change that compact and that understanding. Uh, but, but that's not the issue. The issue is not who has authority on the federal or state basis. The issue, once again, you're not hearing the people, what they're trying to say in sense of the townships. The township sits there. It tells you that there's a problem that they face day in and day out. They're asking simply that this question be raised. And if you give them the simple answer, well, that's federal authority, which may or may not be, which is correct, and you're not going to at least look at the question uh, because of, then you're just going to face more and more resistance uh, to the pipelines, to federal law, and the task force, which is supposed to bring all these ideas together and create some kind of unity, is going to fail in its entity. Uh, because, because what you all have to understand, if you will, please, is that we as legislators, and, and if my friend Bill Keller here was, he would say the same thing to you, you know, each caucus appointed someone. So my job is to tell you the, the pressure we're under from our constituents and to urge you to take up all these questions, to listen to it, not just to take this as industry versus environmental groups or one or the other. So all of these, or federal government can tell you all. What, what Marvin is saying, and Marvin, if I'm wrong, please say it. He is stating the frustration and the feeling of, of, of in our 2,000 and some townships, what officials are saying to you, no? That's correct. But I would, I would add to this that, uh, you know, we understand the difference between the federally regulated pipelines and those that aren't federally regulated with the gathering lines and the interstate lines. We understand that. And we're not talking about necessarily changing those federal regulations. In the first meeting that we had, I, I verbalized my concern about what was going to happen with this report. Is it just a report or is it going to have some teeth in it in the end? I think Secretary Quigley today, uh, at the beginning of our meeting, said this is the beginning of this. And that, <clears throat> We have to follow this up. Somebody has to follow it up, DEP, whoever, to see what, what we can do to implement these recommendations. And it may mean legislation. It may mean policy. 
It may mean that there are some agencies who are going to have to change the way they're doing things. It may, it may look different down the road. And I think what we're saying is, uh, yes, we recognize the difference between the, the FERC lines and, the, and those that aren't regulated by uh, federal. And we just want to exercise what we have been given already through the municipalities planning code and our zoning ordinances that have passed the uh, test of time. That's what we're looking at. All right. Gladys, do you want to jump uh, in? Gladys Brown, P PUC. Um, a lot of discussion going on here. I, so I want to go back to the actual recommendation uh, and, and talk about the PUC safety authority. I, when I talked last time, I, my question was in terms of the surface facilities, but uh, it's my understanding and talking to my staff, we still have the jurisdiction as well, even under surface facilities. In, in terms of the discussion between uh, Senator Dinneman and uh, Keith, you know, I would say that they're both right in a certain sense. Uh, having worked for the Democratic Caucus, uh, the General Assembly did indeed pass Act 127, which gave the jurisdiction to the PUC in terms of gas safety for interstate lines. But in that jurisdiction, it was to carry out the safety uh, from the FEMSA requirements, from the federal requirements. So um, they are both right. By your chair. <laughs> <laughs> Denise? Mr. Secretary, I have a simple request that DCED be added to the relevant agencies on the list. We have a local government services center, and we also tie directly to Act 67 and 68. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And, Joe. And Joe, again, in terms of a comment and clarification, the significant majority of above ground facilities or structures are some type of valves, whether it be a mainline valve or a valve which is purely a safety function in terms of isolating a pipeline, whether it be interstate, interstate, gathering, any. Um, in addition to, conf uh, not that there are any confirmations needed, but as a regulated um, you know, entity by the PUC as well as by FERC with our various different lines, PUC for interstate lines does have the authority to regulate above ground uh, facilities. Um, one thing that local governments still retain is any buildings or structures that are built on a property, governments still have the, local government still has the authority to do that. Um, so just points of clarification. All right. All right. Other questions that I want to make, make perhaps an observation here. Of all of the um, recommendations from the work groups, surprise, surprise, this one generated the most disagreement. In, just in terms of the number of responses to the survey. So I, my question is, in terms of incorporating this into the report, is would some language change to the title be of some value, or is it something that we just want to note in the final report that this particular subject generated the most disagreement, although in terms of numerics, 35 folks responded to this survey, 10 disagreed. So again, there's, there's an element of majority rule here that we also have to bear in mind. So th my, my two-part question is, is there some language change that would help folks be a little bit more comfortable? A and, and secondly, would flagging this as the, the single recommendation that garnered the highest amount of disagreement be of value in the final report? I think we would, Marvin Mateer, I'm sorry. Uh, I think we would entertain uh, language change that might uh, may make people feel more comfortable. I think uh, if there's language change here and, and the department makes that change, we would like to review it. No, I'm, I'm actually asking for it now, Marvin. I, oh, I don't sorry. think the department should make it. Uh, although I will note that uh, even within the recommendation, for example, DEP should provide appropriate suggested land use practices not so much DEP's wheelhouse. Perhaps, as Denise mentioned, DCED and their, the local government services would be much better equipped. So again, there's some, and, which is why I don't want to get into the weeds on the, the language, uh, deep into the weeds on the language here. So I, what I'm looking for is perhaps some suggestions. And I'm seeing Terry, so I'm gonna try Terry. Uh, Terry Bosser, well, let me just say, first off, I think there are 10 disagree and there are also 14 wish to discuss. So there's a goodly number of people who either have some questions about it or, or uh, oppose it. 
And again, this goes back to your earlier comments about the preamble, but th the issues I had with it were number one, beyond the, the surface, the, um, the zoning for the surface facilities, was the implication that the local government was gonna become part of the DEP permitting process, which full recommendation item two seemed to suggest that to me. And then frankly, the recommendation that these, the regulation should be able to be done through standalone ordinances as opposed to a zoning uh, ordinance. And I think the current state of the law is that you can have these regulations, but you need to have a, a zoning ordinance. Um, and I would just say if, if size, density, setbacks, et cetera, of the things that normally you would want to apply to these surface facilities, I would think they would be important for all the buildings in the municipality. So that, those are the reasons, and frankly, I don't remember whether I was disagree or wish to discuss, but I was one or the other. Right. Um, and um, th those were the, the things that concerned me uh, about it, that it kind of sort of went beyond just, all right, we ought to have zoning authority to deal with, you know, the light noise issues that Marvin was talking about. Right. And, and let me just observe, I'm, I'm glad Terry you raised the, the wish to discuss issue. Again, if you look at the 10 who disagreed and 14 who wish to discuss, now they, some of those may be the same folks. But suffice to say that there are at least, okay, then there's a total of 24 folks that wanted to either express disagreement or discuss. We haven't heard from 24 folks in this conversation. That's why we're here. So if there are other folks that want to express concerns or raise questions, this is why we're meeting today. So, Dave. Uh, maybe for the second or third time, Dave Callahan, sorry, I missed you again. Um, just to express concern again about this general issue of where local governments can regulate, where the state can regulate, where the federal government regulates. I would echo Terry's comments on um, being concerned about getting the local governments involved in the permitting process. There are certain notifications to local governments of most of the permits that we uh, apply for. And there is, I believe, an opportunity for the local governments to weigh in on those individual permits, but you're not, a, a, not actually, a, 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 maybe we can. Folks, but please. I would, I would there's perhaps a public Lauren, I see Lauren's up. gonna jump in with that. Whenever you're filing for an ESCGP2 or Chapter 102 or Chapter 105 permit, you have to uh, notify the local county and the local municipality um, and provide a copy of your certified mail receipt with your submission. And then that letter indicates that they have 30 days to provide comments to the department, and we have to provide a copy of the permit application and the drawings. So if people aren't I mean, people should be getting them because we have to provide it, and uh, I'm not getting my permits unless I provide proof to the department that I did it. And, and, and I, would, you, oh, sorry. No, I would just echo uh, Mr. McGinn's earlier comments about what are we talking about facilities. Uh, Mr. Matier noted uh, about structures. Uh, we certainly, when those municipalities who have zoning, we're certainly going through zoning ordinances for the location of compressor stations, especially those that are are not regulated by FERC. Uh, we've, I, we've got a long list of those for those in the gathering side. Uh, but there is significant discussion and concern about you know, what is a facility versus what is a structure. Uh, zoning refers to structures, I believe. Yeah. And, Go ahead, Joe. And Joe McGinn, in terms of whether it be uh, intrastate or interstate transmission lines in general for longer distances, uh, there's a physical challenge to, to the, where you're citing these. I mean, there's a real specific area where these have to be uh, cite it, and there's generally more than one. So any impact, and you know, I'm just presuming here, but probably part of it that came into the federal regulation that would impact the site of one pump station would in turn impact the site of, or compressor station, impact the site of either one, both on either side in the whole system. So, um, you know, there is, I guess in terms of that broader or kind of, you know, utilitarian nature to citing these, um, why, you know, it, it has a lot of sense to be done at a state and a federal level. And we would, this is Cindy Ivey again, we would echo um, Keith Coyle's comments. Um, from a safety perspective of all above ground facilities, there are pig launchers, pig receivers, valve settings, 
Um, there are any number of above ground facilities that are done for safety. Those spacings in between those particular facilities are set by class location and federal law. So there could be no local, local regulation of those kinds of things that we would have to do basically that's already determined by class location as well as pig launchers and receivers, although not everyone does it the exact same, those are safety facilities that we deem where they're needed for specific spe sections of pipe. And there's just, again, no way that a local regulator could understand and know all of the federal law to, to exercise a right of where those facilities would be located. Why don't you simply then just change the word? I mean, there's a question, a legitimate question, Part of it, you just, uh, part of it, Cindy, uh, you helped us understand. They don't know. People don't know. So therefore, it's the clarification, really. And uh, what you're trying to find is clarification of local regulations of surface facilities. Uh, in, from the local perspective, they want to clarify. They might have to think of it a little different than you do. They want to know what their power is. From your perspective, it should be helpful uh, that we clarify this. So instead of you, I mean, you can't ignore it. We can't just throw it out of the report, uh, nor should we. So if we say clarification of local regulations of service facilities, everyone wins. It's not implying that we have a right, but it's implying that it be defined. And that's like, and, and, and from your point of view as a, uh, as a supervisor, it still get, it raises the, from the township supervisors, it raises that fundamental question, which I know uh, and you know, Joe, as well, as that line went across, as Mariner Line went from Pittsburgh straight through to Marcus Hook, or near Pittsburgh, that was the question that was asked in municipality after municipality. I mean, you settled it with most of the municipalities, but that clarification would probably have been very helpful. Would, would clarify, oh, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I do think that the municipalities already have clarification with federal and state law. It is, and, and to Cindy's point, the regulation is critical to us. We have thousands and thousands of pipeliners out there that need consistency on line sweeps, on the diameters of pipe, on the process of the valves, the types of valves. There needs to be consistency. And frankly, um, there's a lot in the industry that don't quite understand some of them consistencies, let alone, you know, and, and this is with all due respect, to a local municipality's mechanical ability to understand what a pig launcher is, to understand that process. So I do believe that it is already spelled out to the municipalities who regulates it. And I think the safety of it is also spelled out to the municipalities under FERC, the PUC, under the people that are actually installing these pipelines, the process that goes through that. If you want to dig deeper in that, in a deeper conversation, we can grill down on the pipe certification, the pipe welder certifications. We can keep grilling down on the qualifications necessary to work on a pipeline. That is another security blanket that I believe municipalities should have and should understand. Let me make a suggestion that I think perhaps what is most of concern about the title here is the word allow. And I think following along the lines of, of Senator Dinneman, perhaps something like clarify and examine the need for local regulation of surface facilities. It clearly calls out that this is a subject that needs further conversation uh, and discussion that uh, it, far beyond the, the scope of this task force, but certainly it is, it is a local issue. It is a local desire. I think it, it's fair to say that there are a lot of local municipalities who have expressed this desire. And, and those desires need to be heard in some kind of an orderly way, again, that is well beyond the scope of this. So my suggestion would be clarify and examine the need for local regulation of surface facilities. How does that sound? Any, any objection to that, Dave? I th or can, other, can, other conversations? Let's, other conversations. Yeah, yeah. Dave Kelly. I think combining this with your other option may be worthwhile as well. Um, maybe having a little bit of both, which is modify the description of this as the way you have, but still recognize in the report that this is, there is significant disagreement over this issue. And we'll continue. Um, we we can ways. certainly note that. Uh, are folks comfortable with that? Go ahead, Joe. And, and, and Joe McGinn, 
um, one suggestion when you look at this one specifically and uh, kind of see a theme in terms of the, the wish to discuss, the agrees, disagrees. As we go through this whole process, I think there's certainly a lot more clarity on a number of points. So I don't know if it's, I'll throw it out there for everyone's thought, but an idea could be to, uh, there were some that didn't uh, complete the survey at all. Um, there was some that put wish to discuss, but to, to clarify in terms of certain points, have the opportunity to take the survey post meeting to determine where those points are and maybe it's, excuse me, a way to help calibrate, you know, how certain, I guess, recommendations are moved forward. Because certainly, you know, a recommendation like this one with, with, I guess, seven that agree versus some that have 30 or et cetera, um, I, I, there should be some kind of calibration there. Right, in, in, in an attempt to at least start the calibration, that's why we sent out this form yesterday. So, I, But I, I take that suggestion. Uh, let us see what the data says on the forms first, and then if we need to take the additional step of a resurvey, we'll do that work if that's what we need to do to, to help folks get comfortable. So I appreciate the suggestion. Anything else on this recommendation? All right, let us try to move on then to page nine. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, due to a scheduling uh, conflict that I alerted you to earlier, yes. and plus, actually, I think it follows our conversation we just had. If I could just go over the siting and routing, uh, introduce it. I know we have task members here who could continue the conversation. Sure. Sure. And And uh, I ask for forgiveness to public involvement and public participation if we could just change the agenda for, for the next few minutes. Sure, sure. We'll, okay. we'll turn to siting and routing. Uh, the, there was only one recommendation that we highlighted, and that was number four on page 295. Uh, create a task force of affected stakeholders to study the creation of new regulatory entity or empower existing regulatory entity to review and approve the siting and routing of intrastate intra gas transmission lines. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to clarify is uh, this evolved from a conversation in our, in our work group. Uh, initially, we were talking about creating a commission to oversee the siting and routing of intrastate, again, it's intrastate gas transmission pipelines, and we changed that to creating a task force to determine the need uh, for a commission um, so we could address the cumulative impacts of multiple pipelines uh, over the coming years, again, intrastate, uh, there is no, uh, there is no, uh, as far as interstate, no body right now that has the authority. We, ha as we've um, noted, uh, as we've remarked here, uh, there is local zoning, but not every uh, municipality has zoning uh, codes here that that apply. As we know, some municipalities don't have zoning at all, and so this would help, uh, particularly with the the cumul cumulative impacts. Also, in light of the discussion here, as we modify, uh, this could also be, you know, explore the creation uh, and, and, and maybe not create the task force, if that's something we want to discuss as well. Um, but I just also wanted to note that in our conversation, it was brought up that Ohio and New York has uh, done a similar uh, type of thought process, and so we would definitely want to see, you know, lessons learned there and, and what's working and what's not working there. Uh, noted as as we have noted before, FERC does help with intrastate. I mean, interstate, I should say. Um, but this would be something specific to interstate. So I put that out there for a conversation. Thank you. Responses, questions for the secretary. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, Dave Messer Smith with uh, Penn State University. Um, I just wanted to maybe raise the concern that um, when we talk about having an agency get involved in routing and siting of pipelines is that it could possibly expand uh, the use of eminent domain, um, which is one of the issues that many landowners are most concerned about with pipeline uh, projects. So I just want the, maybe the work group and the committee or the task force to understand that it might uh, expand the use of eminent domain should this, should this recommendation move forward. There. And Secretary, you did mention some, perhaps some, I'll say, I'll use the word softening of the language instead of create, explore the creation. Would that make folks feel more comfortable? Obviously, this is an extremely complex issue and needs a lot more discussion than we'll ever have time to have in this task force. Again, this is the tee up questions for the future. So would folks be more comfortable with the idea of exploring the creation of a task force? Would that help? Right. 
Secretary Richards is simply again responding to what people in her task force said. And so we have to respect what that task force said and, and the softening of language simply shows we respect it and we're willing to address the question. So I, I think it, uh, you know. I think it could, even, it, it could be shortened and um, that it could say explore the creation of the new regulatory entity or empower, I mean that's, that's really what the task force would do and that way in the discussion we could even explore how we look at it. And, and that would be up for discussion if people want to do that at all. I know, Dwayne, uh, you, you were part of the discussion. Dwayne Peters. Dwayne. Dwayne Peters, there I am. Uh, I think the uh, citing and routing thing kind of snuck in there. And the intent wasn't necessarily to, to bring up anything in terms of eminent domain for uh, gathering systems. We were really focused on the conversation of cumulative impacts and the fact that there really isn't a standard definition for cumulative impacts. It's, it's a very hot topic right now. And if we would have a discussion on cumulative impacts, we couldn't just look at pipelines. It's very hard to discuss cumulative impacts and not include any kind of build out. And we did kind of trend down into some of the other issues that some of the other works groups gave, such as testing in upland areas for archeology span that are more NEPA based and not necessarily within the current permit system. So this is almost a first step to look at the feasibility of that kind of build out. Um, and we focus just on the hot issue right now, which is cumulative impacts. So this task force will probably tackle a lot of things. It might include a lot of the items brought up in the other work groups. But our concern is, and we certainly couldn't come to a consensus, but we all agreed that this is a very big topic that needs a lot of discussion and input from the same, same type of stakeholders that make up this task force and should be weighed pretty heavily. So, so just in, to make sure I have the language right, Secretary, do, do you want to walk us through what the revised title should be or do you want me to take no, a whack? In listening and remembering the exact I, I would recommend, I would, uh, I, I would say we could say uh, explore if that helps as far as create, but I, let's keep the task force. I was thinking we could even uh, take that out, but I think we should keep the task force. I, I do think that this warrants a thorough discussion, and I do think part of the discussion should be looking at Ohio and New York uh, as, as far as, um, you know, identify how we quantify the cumulative impacts. It's going to be a thorough discussion, so uh, I would just change create to explore and keep the rest of it. Okay. Okay. Other questions, comments on this subject? Okay. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you uh, so much. Let us move to public participation number five on page 286. Require publication of intent to apply for DEP permits associated with pipeline development. Do you want me to add a little bit to that? Please. Uh, the, the conversation around this particular uh, recommendation centered on the fact that um, permits are now published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin, and that's really the only place that they're published, and that the public doesn't typically read the Pennsylvania Bulletin. So it was allowing um, a way for, uh, another way for public participation to occur by letting um, folks in uh, local areas through their newspapers in the legal notices section typically of the intent of an applicant to file four permits with the DEP at least three days in advance. And it was really just a way to allow the public to have one more um, uh, in, you know, way of input um, and at least know about those particular permits before they are filed. And also, just one more thought about that on regulated projects. Um, we do file similar um, notices of application. So we reference that particular FERC uh, regulation in the recommendation just as a point of reference that um, before we file our FERC applications, we do very similar things. It's a little bit longer lead time. I think it's about two weeks and you have to do it twice. But it was really kind of modeled after the fact that um, that permit applications at PayDEP would also fall in a, under a similar type of notice. 
questions for clarification? Ken. So, Ken Climo, um, the, uh, I, I guess the question again is, is whether uh, requiring pipeline uh, permits to be uh, published like this, you know, would this then lead to other kinds of, of um, applications, you know, that are going to go through uh, DEP, would they also have to uh, be published in a local newspaper? That would have to be discussed in the follow-on work. Mm -hmm. Again, the, 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 this has been raised a number of times here this afternoon about the, uh, the applicability of some of these recommendations to other types of development, and it's a legitimate question, and really I think would have to be teased through uh, with a lot of lawyers in the room. Bills right now to expand the public knowledge and notification. So the recommendation fits very well into what we are now considering in committee. Uh, uh, and uh, for example, Mr. Secretary, um, you know, at least on FERC, we can we have all the notices online. And it's something DEP has, because of resources and others, doesn't have the same capacity at FERC. So one of those bills is to assure that DEP. Uh, the public can get access to it, similar to FERC. So, so this whole question of public notification is one that's, uh, and, how you, and how you do it, is one of great importance. And I thank uh, uh, Ms. Ivey uh, for taking the lead on that in the, in the community. Other questions on this recommendation? Well, I'll jump in. Go ahead, Dave. Dave Callahan. Um, I just think I'd just register one concern on the resource intensiveness of doing something like this versus publication in the bulletin. Uh, for certain permits, certain hearings, we do publish locally. Um, there is just, I would just register my concern uh, with the cost benefit of this as well as the resource intensiveness. Hmm. Other? But, but if you want to be transparent, then transparency has a cost, does it not? It, it, All right, folks, there, public comments I, I would just I would just say that the general permit process was put together in such a way that required publication of the bulletin as a means of public notification. Do you really and, believe, sir, uh, that any citizen of this Commonwealth reads the Pennsylvania Bulletin uh, on a regular basis? And that's, and we've debated this in the Senate about whether notifications should simply be put online. And we came to the conclusion, no, they should go in a newspaper because they have a significant number of people who never do, don't know how to get online or don't go online. I think there are a lot no of one items. reads the, jur the journal. No one even knows it exists, sir. I think there are a lot of items up for discussion that could be considered along with whether this applies to all permits, all permits for other industries. I think this is a much longer discussion than just publish all your permit applications in the newspaper just for pipelines. Yes, but the task force only is dealing with pipelines. Um, David, do you have a, a specific suggestion, whether it's on the title, as we tried to do on a couple of other of these recommendations? Is there some something? I'd have to give that tweet? some thought to filling when I fill out my survey. Okay. Uh, right. Everything that's due by the 14th. Right. Any other discussion on this item? All right. L let me say a, a couple of things here, folks. You know, obviously, this was uh, an attempt to start managing uh, all of the recommendations that we have in front of us. Uh, we have all known about the timeline from the beginning of this assignment. Uh, so at some level, we knew the job was dangerous when we took it. Uh, we have committed, and I've committed here this afternoon, to at least four deliverables uh, for the next meeting, if not before. Uh, one, to identify pending legislation that is on point. Um, two, compiling the wish to discuss form results and coming back to you with uh, some recommendations as to how we proceed to deal with the wish to discuss issue. Uh, three, develop some uh, draft preamble language that we will all uh, work on together at the next meeting. And, and fourth, uh, flag the duplicates and try to coalesce them in, in some way, shape, or form. So there are the four uh, deliverables that, that we have committed to here at the staffing level. But I want to open up the floor before we get to public comment for questions, comments, observations, uh, feedback on how this process has gone today and, and how satisfied or not uh, the members of the task force might be, suggestions for better ways to skin the cat. 
Yes. I, I just want to thank you for your leadership on this. I know that was not an easy task, and I, I do appreciate your response to me that we in our, our forums could give more detailed concerns that will go out to the entire task force. Mike. Mike for us. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you had also mentioned a letter that you would be looking for all of us to sign off on that will accompany the report. Is that something that you'll be drafting and circulating this list of deliverables or looking for yes. input from us yes. on? Yes, I'll add it to the, the list Thank to you. get out ASAP. Ken. So in terms of further deliberation and, and massaging of these recommendations, um, again, as I see one potential step here is to be able to um, allow people who are on the task force to be able to weigh in on those maybe four or five or six items that they have particular interest in. And then, um, you know, so that might be a way of, of helping out. So I don't know if, uh, you know, how you would uh, systematize that, but I think, you know, that, that would be a beneficial thing to try to, you know, figure out who, who's really interested in working on what. And, and that was the purpose of those forms that we sent out yesterday. Right, okay. Go ahead. Mr. Secretary, uh, we had no opportunity to save the survey form as we sent it in. Is it possible to return those to us uh, so that we can fill out the forms properly? I think there is. I, smart people in the room are telling me yes, there is. <laughs> Thank you. Bill Kiger. Any other questions, comments? So Mr. Secretary, Tim. Tom Hutchins, Tom. a point of clarification. At one point you mentioned a December meeting in the I, next meeting. Not I may, yes, I misspoke. It was in our next meeting is in January. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. And I thought the process at times painful, but I thought effective. And I think the reason you didn't hear from everybody who maybe was against or wished to discuss was that many of the things that the people who did talk about touched on the issues that, that led us to, the, to one of those two choices. Uh, it will be very challenging to address the other activities that had a lot of wish to discuss issues on it. And so I think figuring a way to effectively do that is another challenge for you, but I think you're up for it. Well, I appreciate the confidence. I, I, I will say though, I welcome suggestions. Hi, Christine George Schwartz. Um, as we go into January now, um, will the governor or will this task force now take all this and put it maybe in context with the uh, federal energy, um, the quadrennial energy review uh, that came out earlier this year? Because it does address uh, modernization of uh, our energy infrastructure, including pipelines. Well, I, I think that it will be part of the follow-on work of this report is to harmonize and align recommendations with what else is going on in the world. And th again, this is, this is really the first step in a, a, a much longer journey. Other questions? Cindy. One point. Um, to Joe McGinn's suggestion, this is Cindy Ivey again. Um, it might actually be helpful, and I think maybe Sarah mentioned this too, um, but it might be good if there is a way for the task force members to retake uh, the survey before we send in all the forms. I know that I answered uh, most of them. Majority needs further discussion simply because we did think we would have further discussion. I think now certainly we would be able to vote differently or maybe the same on the ones that we actually did discuss. Um, so I think you might have a better understanding of where people stand um, if we retook the survey first and then maybe um, filled in the forms to, to discuss. It may give you a better, a better idea of where the membership stands. How do others feel about that suggestion? On that, I think that's a great recommendation. We expected that there would be an opportunity for more uh, discussion around some of them. Um, we will utilize the form you provided, but um, redoing the uh, survey isn't a bad idea in our opinion. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the most problematic aspect of, of the form was this whole wish to discuss thing. So in, in terms of the next survey, do we keep the same columns? Do we, do we reduce? 
I think you should take out the wish to discuss. Yeah, okay. I, or that or a place to have add comments on the survey. There's no place right now to add any comments, so the only thing we had to default to was wish to discuss further. I think you could probably solve both things in one survey form. If you had a comment section, we could put the comments into the survey and uh, register our vote, and then you wouldn't need the additional forms. You'd have the comments as part of the survey. Well, I don't think the particular tool that we used for that first survey accommodates that. So we'll look and see if there's another online tool that might suffice, or we'll look for plan B. Denise. Mr. Secretary, I know the timing of this report is very condensed and that we're coming upon a holiday season. Yet, I would still recommend that the task force meet one more time before January 13th. I just think there's too many things hanging with regard to resurveying people, collecting information on paper forms, that I think we could make great progress by meeting one more time before January 13th. How do other folks feel about that? <laughs> Any, anybody violently disagree? <laughs> Uh, well, all right, we will suggest uh, a date for a meeting in December, and again, I, I appreciate that. Looking at the, at the clock here, we're, we're going to have public comment period, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but we discussed today 13 recommendations in three hours. Uh, so uh, just kind of keep that metric in mind. But we will, we will look for, at scheduling a meeting date in December. We will re-survey. And then we will then we'll go to the forums, or if there's some way to combine the two, and do the comments in a survey instrument, we'll see if we can scope that out. Uh, we will do that very quickly, unless when I go back to the office, my staff kills me, uh, which is a distinct possibility. Uh, all right. Anything else before we uh, go ahead, Bill? Bill Kiger again. Uh, could it be possible that we do the duplication emission or? Yeah, deletion combining. before we, yes, before we uh, do this second survey, it would save an awful lot of time for everyone. Yes. Well, I'm not sure it will save an awful lot, but we can certainly flag them uh, with relative ease. I think some of the parties have already submitted some of the duplication uh, information, so it might be a little less problem than you right. might think. Okay. okay. Other questions? I appreciate everybody's tolerance of, of this messy process. Uh, now we come to the public comment portion of the meeting. I will say this. There are 47 volunteers around this room, uh, and I'm respectful of your schedules, and, and you, if folks need to leave, you don't feel constrained. But I'm staying. I'm staying. So the stenographer is staying. Now we, we have a limited broadcast. That we will have a record that, that, that's at the option of the task, at the members of the task force, if folks having schedules of their own. This is, so have I. And now we come for public comment. If folks need to, because of their schedules, leave, that's fine. Uh, I'll stay. And anyone else cares to stay, please feel free to do so. Again, I want to emphasize here, we're asking folks, uh, and I have a list of folks who have signed up to testify. I'm going to apologize in advance for mispronouncing names, because I have to read uh, about 26 sets of handwriting, uh, some of which are better than others. Uh, we are asking folks to limit their comments to two minutes. Uh, I'll remind everyone that we have a, an open public comment period where extensive comments can be submitted online uh, to the agency. Uh, so again, we're asking folks to keep their comments to two minutes, please. We will time that and, and try to keep this moving along. The first uh, individual who has uh, signed up to offer comment is Karen Ferriden, followed by Heath Strock, followed by Craig Stevens. This has been a surreal experience. I mean, we're sitting here, the members of the public listening to you talking about us, but not allowing us to contribute until now for two minutes. So we thought we'd help out by providing you with 
tens of thousands of comments from people fighting nine different pipeline fights and more are coming. Check out your docket. Um, we have lots of things uh, that we're including in our paperwork that we'd like you to review because what you seem to be missing is the main points that people don't like not having the opportunity, number one, to comment until the end of a meeting for only two minutes. They don't like having a public comment period start four days before you start finalizing the report. They don't like the fact that there are no public hearings whatsoever to hear from the public. You know, we are sort of considered the pesky public in your view. And I think you think that we're just like fringe elements of some you know, environmental movement or something. But no, we actually represent the people whose comments you will read as part of the comment period who have been fighting eminent domain, who have been fighting contaminated water, who have been fighting to get some kind of help for their health issues. We're talking about a very serious problem in Pennsylvania. And the other thing that you're missing is that the people who are represented here today either in person or in the comments that you're going to be receiving, are not worried about whether you get to build a better pipeline, a better regulated pipeline. We're saying no pipelines, no fracking. And it's because every reputable climate scientist in the world is telling us we need to leave 80% of it in the ground. So it doesn't matter if you put it here or there. It shouldn't go anywhere. You're killing the planet, and you're sitting around in a conference room having a polite discussion about how to do it. It's obscene what's happening here. I'm embarrassed sometimes to be a Pennsylvanian. Today we have people from out of state who have come who are saying no frack gas. We've banned it in New York. We don't want your frack gas coming into our state now to hear how the public is being treated, to see our colleagues being dragged out of the room because they wanted to say something as a comment on what was being discussed at the time. There are already people leaving this room now who don't want to hear what we have to say. And we don't get a chance to comment in front of them because they couldn't stick around long enough, even though we had to stay here through the entire meeting to get our paltry two minutes. You should be embarrassed. Which, incidentally, is up. It's really embarrassing what you're doing. It's an insult to Pennsylvanians, taxpayers, who pay the salaries of a lot of people in this room and who deserve to be protected. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next, uh, Heath Strzok, followed by Craig Stevens, followed by Michael Helfrich. Yeah, if, if we could, folks, would you please spell your names uh, for the stenographer? Come up to the, the microphone, Heath, please. Yes, sir. When do I start? Go ahead. My name is Heath Alexander Strzok, and I've been opposed to the pipelines. Are there any questions for me? This is your nickel. We're here. To, we're here to listen to you. Could I have a? Could I have? Could I have some sort of timer or something so I don't get kicked out again or get beat up by a Capitol policeman? You got a minute and a half to go. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. If you have something to say, please share it with us. I am opposed to the pipelines. I am opposed to natural gas and methane. I'm not opposed to family farms. I, I am, oh, I should have taken a class in public speaking. I want family farms. I want democracy. I want real local government. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Next, Craig Stevens, followed by Michael Helf Helfrick, sorry, followed by Sam, and all I got here is Sam K-L. That's the one you picked out. Okay. Then that will be followed by Isaac. Can't read the last name. Silberman Gorn. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, Craig. Um, sitting here watching this, I'm a, I'm a proud sixth generation landowner in Silver Lake Township, Pennsylvania, and fifth generation New Yorker. I'm far more proud of being a fifth generation New Yorker today. And you in the industry that are here, by the way, a lot of industry faces. Hey, great to have you here. You know what I'm most happy about? You're going broke, because you know what? You're going the way of the buggy whip and the VHS tape, and thank God for that. 
You think you're funny. You're going to come in and tell us what to do. And you, Mr. Coyle over here, tell us what the feds are saying. I'm a federal taxpayer and a citizen of the Commonwealth. I pay your salary if you work for the state or the federal government. And we're tired of you telling us what to do. You know what? The Founding Fathers would have tolerated this stuff for about five minutes. And anybody here that's a real patriot would have known that. They would have told you to pack your wagons up and get out of their community and do it right now, Senator. That's what they should be doing. Listen to me very closely. A public utility is a power line or a phone line or a cable wire that I have access to. They tried to use eminent domain on me. They called it certificate of public convenience for a pipeline. And I went and I read the Fifth Amendment to the CEOs. And I said, when are we getting our gas to our homes? You're not. Then you don't meet the requirement to be a public utility. You have to provide a service for the land you stole at a regulated rate. I'm getting so tired of listening to this. You know, democracy, this is a democratic process. You know what the Founding Fathers said about democracy? That's two wolves and a sheep voting what's for dinner. And we're not sheep. We're not going away. If it's not me in my lifetime, my children will, or my grandchildren will watch you guys go the way of the dodo, because this is a depleting resource. You're going broke. I'm a businessman for 30 years, and you have none of you that are in the industry have proven you can make money on this. Why are you $200 billion in debt? Why are you going to now talk about sending it overseas? Sending gas overseas? Ha. Huh. Where? From Co Point, where you're going to send it to China? and you're going to send it to Japan and India, you can't pick a further away from Co Point than, than India or Japan. This is a joke. Okay, could you wrap up, please? Go yeah, ahead. anybody that swore an oath to uh, defend the citizens of the Commonwealth or the United States should be embarrassed sitting here. And you industry folks, I can't wait to watch you guys go out of business. What, 20 or 30 already have. <laughs> And we're going to applaud it. And when we see the taillights of your vehicles leave, and y'all have fun, because y'all aren't, aren't welcome here, go back where you're from, because we're taking our state back. Thank you very much. Next, Michael Helfrick, followed by Isaac, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, followed by Ellie Salahub. Good afternoon, I'm Michael Helfrick. I'm the Lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper. I represent the members of Stewards of the Lower Susquehanna from Sunbury down to the Chesapeake Bay, from Altoona to out near Reading. 9,215 square miles of the Lower Susquehanna region. Um, first, I would like to say, and as the former secretary, Mr. Quigley of the DCNR, um, I just got the, uh, the forest management, management, forest resource management plan and uh, we have 60 days to comment on that. Um, I would suggest that it is not as um, highly a debated topic as this document is. Uh, I also feel that um, they're also providing 12 different meetings around the state for public input. Uh, I don't exactly understand what the rush is. I would ask you to ask uh, Governor Wolf, and if I see him over Christmas, I'll ask him um, to lengthen this period a little bit. I, the one thing I got out of this is that I think everybody around here feels rushed. Whether, no matter what side you're on, there, you, know, you only got through 13 things today. I really think it is better for everyone, everyone sitting here, the public, give us a little bit more time. And again, please go and ask Governor Wolf. While I have the opportunity, I have the gentleman from FERC standing right, or sitting right next to me, that's wonderful. Um, I'm concerned that pipelines are a speculative industry in Pennsylvania, and they are not supporting the public good in most instances. Numbers were given, thrown around, thrown to FERC in 2013 when gas was $20 in Japan and in Taiwan and in Korea. Those numbers are now down to $7.25, and it costs $7 to liquefy gas. Cabot Oil, half of the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline being proposed by Williams, half of it is already registered to go to Japanese corporations or WGL. It's all for export for something that's already gone. They're putting the nuclear plants back online. The price dropped from $20 to $7. We cannot allow Pennsylvania to be carved up for speculation for foreign companies. Next, Isaac, 
uh, followed by Ellie Salahub, followed by Marjorie. I'm going to try take a ch chance at this one. D. Martellier. I hope I was close. All right, cool. Thank you. So my name is Isaac Silberman Gorn with Citizen Action of New York, New Yorkers Against Fracking, here from Binghamton, New York today. Um, first thing, it'd be really nice to see an agenda and forcing residents, taxpayers to sit through three hours of meeting without any clue when we're going to get to make com comment is really pretty outrageous. And if in New York that were to happen, there would there would be some pretty significant backlash. So we sit 10 miles north of two of two of the heaviest drilled counties in Pennsylvania, Bradford and Susquehanna, including Dimmick, where uh, some very famous water contamination there. Um, DEP is complicit in creating a disaster zone just south of us, just south of our border. So we're here to ask for three things. One, this task force needs to be shut down immediately. This is outrageous. Two, an immediate stop to fracking. Pennsylvania is a quarter of the way fracked. If you industry folks have your way, that's another 75,000 well, 75, wells or so with contamination that's gonna be coming and getting worse as well casings fail and as more pipelines leak and degrade over time. Um, and three, help the harmed. You have a disaster zone just south of New York. As an activist making no money, I'm helping. I'm the one who's delivering water to people, standing up to industry. In what the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection should be doing, and you, Secretary Squiggly. Um, Quigley, pardon me. That, that was an honest mistake. Um, pipelines are a 60 to 100 year investment in fossil fuels. We don't have 60 to 100 years if we want to see a livable future for our kids. If we want New York City and Florida to not be underwater, a world-class pipeline development program is no new ones, period. So in New York, where are we at? We've actually turned the corner. We banned fracking. We're working against pipelines. Governor Cuomo vetoed Port Ambrose just like this past week. 100 people out yesterday to participate in New York's Reforming the Energy Vision, which is actually going to set, so rather than talk about this nitty gritty pipeline, how can we make it a little bit better, we're actually talking about how to have solar, how to have local control, so communities get to decide their own fates, so we're dependent on our own power generation rather than out-of-state companies who are going to pollute us and not care and have no loyalty to us whatsoever. And this is happening in New York right now. You have the opportunity to actually lead on this and take us towards a renewable energy future, which we know that we need. Um, Could you wrap up, please? Right. Yeah, and we're absolutely, thank you. And so we're here, New Yorkers are not gonna stop standing with our neighbors in Pennsylvania. We're not gonna stop standing with affected families who the, the gas industry has poisoned. So thank you so much for the opportunity to comment and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Next, Ellie Salahub, followed by Margie D. Martellier, followed by Patty Cronheim. Thank you. I'm Ellie Salahub, and I represent Lebanon Pipeline Awareness in Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. Secretary Quigley, where is the public in this process? Once again, we have been marginalized with no representation, an insufficient 30-day comment period, and no scheduled public hearings before this report is adopted. The public comment period needs to be extended to 90 days, and statewide public hearings need to be held that accommodate work schedules. Industry representatives on this task force, along with their state and federal lobbyists, ensure their interests and profits are well protected. New York State studied the industry and banned fracking. Pennsylvania needs to follow their lead and not this quixotic and archaic regressive venture to further develop fossil fuel infrastructure. This review of pipelines cannot be separated from the deleterious impacts of the industry in toto. Pennsylvania is a failed experiment that cannot be salvaged. There was no formal collection of baseline geologic and hydrologic data, nor ongoing collection and studies of health impacts. We are left with gas and pipeline companies denying culpability and state and federal agencies and our state legislature operating as industry partners. The voices of banning fossil fuel development are blatantly missing from this task force and the report. The private and public sectors need to dedicate and commit their intellectual, 
technological and financial resources to develop innovative renewable energy. That should be the sole recommendation of this task force in response to climate change and our constitutional right to clean air, water, and a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Margie de Martelier, followed by Patty Cronheim, followed by Fairfax Hutter. Margie? Not seeing Margie? Okay, we'll move on to uh, Patty Cronheim, followed by Fairfax Hutter, followed by Elise Gerhardt. Good afternoon. My name is Patty Cronheim. I'm from Hopewell Township, New Jersey. I crossed the river today. And uh, I'm representing Hopewell Township Citizens Against the Pennies Pipeline, as well as Rethink Energy New Jersey, which is a new data-driven campaign to look at energy issues in New Jersey and in the region. Now, uh, one of the things that most people will know is that New Jerseyans really can't agree on much. And I think Mr. Tambini will agree with that as evidence that. But one of the things that we can agree on is there's been a recent uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University poll that shows that four out of five New Jerseyans are concerned about pipelines. Four out of five New Jerseyans think we should be investing in renewables rather than in fossil fuels like natural gas. 78% favor a bill requiring 80% renewables by 2050. And that's only 25 years from now. And worldwide, 60% of all new energy investment is going to renewables, not to fossil fuels. And in New Jersey, we don't want the pipelines coming through the state. And that's how the people of New Jersey clearly feel, as evidenced by 70% of the people who live along the Penn East pipeline, how I first got involved with gas pipelines, rejecting survey permission to Penn East and its partners. And yet here we are, talking about how to divide up the spoils of fossil fuels, not if not if we should keep the gas in the ground, not if there should be pipelines at all. And that's what I see wrong with this particular task force. And it's a little science light, I have to say. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Klimau is here, but I, I think uh, there aren't a lot, of, uh, a lot of, not a lot of pure scientists here. And that's what's needed to really look at the modeling that would look at the cost and the need for pipelines. We need to look at the human and environmental impacts, we need to look at the cost of climate change, and look at them in a long-term way. We found out, you know, in New Jersey, by 2050, if we were at renewables, we would save, as a state, $12.5 billion a year in medical costs. That's massive. That's 1% of our GDP in New Jersey. And I can only imagine in Pennsylvania, it would be massive amounts of money as well. We look to look at the need. Right now, we've got record gas stores. We've got projected decrease in winter gas rates. We've got foreign falling foreign gas prices. There is a real risk of stranded assets from overbuilding, and there is no comprehensive planning, which I will say to uh, Mr. Hanabek of FERC. We have been speaking with FERC about the need for programmatic environmental impact studies that look at pipelines as a whole, not piecemeal, in this competitive rush to market against each other and against renewables. Patty, could you wrap up, please? I will certainly wrap up, and thank, thank you. you. So I want to finish by saying that Pennsylvania has a huge responsibility and the people of the region, in New Jersey, and even the world are looking you to manage your resources responsibly. Take the long view and don't buy into the industry grass race to rush product to market because that's a boom. And when that boom goes bust, as booms do, today's short-term financial gains will not be nearly enough to cover tomorrow's enormous human and environmental costs. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Fairfax Hutter, followed by Elise Gerhardt, followed by Robin McGuire. Hello, I'm Fairfax Hutter of Lawrenceville, New Jersey. I'm a New Jersey resident, but I'm also a co-owner of two plus miles worth of trout stream in Pennsylvania. And that's been in the family for three generations. One of my questions is, and a very basic one is, um, who says that 30,000 miles of pipeline and the taking of 300,000 acres of Pennsylvania is needed for these pipelines? Is anyone questioning those premises? I haven't seen a discussion for the actual need for such a volume. Our New Jersey research shows that ample, ample pipeline capacity. I would think you should be trying to minimize the, the damage and so forth and trying to do as little with 
as, as little as possible in terms of disturbance. Um, and what you do in Pennsylvania has a direct effect on us in New Jersey. The pipelines are being foisted upon us, <clears throat> and it, 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 it feels as if, I feel as if I'm at the Susquehanna River trying to sandbag against ag the flood of Agnes. Uh, the, the pressures on New Jersey from your decisions are enormous and r most unwanted. Um, I also noticed that industry has an enormous voice here. I saw some of your recommendations where words requirements and monitoring are getting watered down. Um, I'm extremely concerned about this. Um, I am a taxpayer and I care about what I love and know about in Pennsylvania and I would hate to see regular I would like to see this much better regulated and not regulations watered down with lots of flexibility. And I go to a lot of public park commission meetings in New Jersey and so forth. I see a lot of what goes on. And when you don't have regulations with teeth, when things are loose and open-ended and just best management practices suggested, uh, I see people cutting corners and getting around those all the time. It's extremely worrisome. We don't have the open space you have in New Jersey, we don't open, have the open space you have, and your pipelines are now coming through our most prized, protected natural areas. Uh, those are the ones that have been targeted. So we're really um, opposed to this. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Next, Elise Gerhardt, followed by Robin McGuire, followed by Wendy Taylor. My name is Elise, and I'm from Huntington County, Pennsylvania. And I know that everybody in this room knows that there's enough existing infrastructure in Pennsylvania to meet Pennsylvania's needs for energy. And I'm here representing two people who couldn't be here today. The first being my mother, a retired special education teacher who taught in the Commonwealth for 32 years. And my father, who was accepted to Pennsylvania as a refugee fleeing extreme violence in his home country. These are people who worked their entire lives for a safe and peaceful place to live. Um, they also enrolled their property in the forest stewardship program. They made an agreement with the Commonwealth to preserve their forested land, which they have successfully done since 1982. Now, in a complete disregard for that pact between Pennsylvania citizens and their government, Sunoco Logistics wants to come in and clear cut 3.2 acres of their property, berry streams, berry springs. So I want to know, what's the Commonwealth going to do about that? Um, I also want to say there was a comment made earlier, and I don't know who made it, but that um, you know we understand the difference between interstate and intrastate pipelines and who regulates them. Well, you know what? We don't because corporations like Sunoco get up in court and say that they are both, that they have the same pipeline is both. That goes against all basic human understanding of logic, okay? I know you people are not that dumb. So I know that some of y'all are not from around here, but I suggest that you all read the Pennsylvania Constitution, especially Article 27, that says that all Pennsylvanians have the right to clean air and pure water and preservation of our environment, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. And if you can't respect that, then you need to stay out of our state. Thank you. Next, Robin McGuire, followed by Wendy Taylor, followed by Tim Spies. I hope I'm getting that name right. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Robin McGuire from Conestoga. I'm here to speak for the old ones who have no voices, the American Indians whose sacred places we are destroying in our mad rush to squeeze the lifeblood from Mother Earth. Conestoga Township, where I'm from, has been occupied for over 8,000 years. As proposed, the entire 4.1 miles of the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline in Conestoga would cross site after site, one of which possibly has Aztec influence. Yes, Aztecs in Conestoga. There is nowhere in Conestoga that this pipeline can go without impacting sacred grounds. If bulldozers destroy these places and crush skulls from burials, there will be a national outrage like you have never seen. Wanishi Wado, many blessings on you. Thank you. 
Next, Wendy Taylor, followed by Tim Spies. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this 335-page report. First, I would like to ask for, for a 60-day extension to the comment period to allow the public to digest the report. As chair of the Pennsylvania Sierra Club, I have heard many accounts from property owners and community leaders about the conduct of this industry. We insist that DEP insists that this industry begins treating people and the public at large respectfully and dealing with them honestly and fairly. If this project is really in the public's interest, convince us, stop running over us. Further, I would like to invoke the precautionary principle. It says, that when an activity may threaten human health and the environment, precautionary measures should be taken. It also shifts the burden of proof to the proponent of the activity. It is better to halt the activity until the risks to the environment are known, have been accounted for, have been prevented or mitigated. Do we really know the environmental damage that developing gas fields, building compressor stations, and constructing pipeline has caused and will cause. The purpose of the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Task Force is to minimize the footprint of any new infrastructure. However, shouldn't we first develop a comprehensive policy inquiry into whether and to what extent any more infrastructure is actually needed and is it in the public interest? The answer may very well be that the public costs outweigh the public benefits and that the Commonwealth should not be spurring more unneeded infrastructure until it has a full accounting of the costs and benefits. Let's assess the cost and benefit of keeping fossil fuels in the ground and developing a less carbon intensive economy. Chief Justice Castile wrote in his opinion of the Robinson Township case that the Commonwealth has an obligation to refrain from performing its trustee duties respecting the environment unreasonably. As a trustee, the Commonwealth has a duty to refrain from permitting or encouraging the degradation and the depletion of the public natural resources either by direct state action or by failing to restrain actions of private property. Could you wrap up, please, Wendy? Uh, surely. I hope that you will take Justice Castile's words to heart. Thank you. <laughs> Next, Tim Spies, and then we'll see if anyone who has not signed up would like to come forward. So, Tim Spies. Uh, hi, my name is Tim Spies. Thank you for getting that pronunciation right. Not many do. Uh, before I forget, I wanted to say, Secretary Quigley, that I did del hand deliver a, a personal letter from Melinda Clatterbuck, who could not be here today, to one of your staff. And I just want to make sure you got that. Um, it's nice going later on in the lineup because there's a lot I don't have to say. Karen Faraday covered uh, global warming and the incredible, uh, frightening prospect that it is possible that we could be getting ready to take action part of which is decided here, that could destroy a large portion of humankind and most of life on Earth. Now, I know scientists are still arguing about some things, but most agree that global warming is happening. Most agree that it's caused by man. What they haven't settled on yet is how many people will die and when. So if we're at that point where we have to talk about how many people will die and will it be 100 years or 200 years, folks, we've gone too far. So not now, but at home tonight, People in the industry and the people in other agencies that have a say in this, think about that. Think about that. Good Lord, what are we doing? If it's even remotely possible, what are we doing? Michael Helfrich talked about the financial uh, ridiculousness of all this. We have part of our statements that we're going to contribute. Uh, a gentleman, uh, Dennis Whitmer, spoke in Lancaster twice, and I'll bet you none of you were there. He's a senior energy analyst who, in a nutshell, it's a 50-minute presentation, in a nutshell, he said, this LNG export, these pipelines, this is an economic joke. 
You're all sitting here at a poker game and none of you even have a pair and you're all waiting to see who folds first. It's not economically feasible, it's not environmentally wise, and social justice, um, uh, eminent domain, to take people's property for private gain is about as un-American as you can get. So let me talk about one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet, a brief history lesson. The War of Independence was not fought against a government, it was fought against the East India Trading Company, a corporation with the government backing. People had, to go to, people had to get shot at and risk their lives. We prevailed. In 1860, there was a war between the states over slavery. People died to help give uh, freedom to African-American slaves. In the early part of the century, the women suffrage movement brought the right to vote to women. People, men and women, were arrested and went to jail. So women now have the right to vote. And I don't think anyone wants to bring back slavery. And I don't think anyone thinks women shouldn't have a right to vote. In the 1960s, four young African-American men walked into a, 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 a restaurant and sat down and ordered sandwiches. And they brought their toothbrushes with them because they knew they were going to jail. And these are the movement. This is how change has happened in this country. And that's what I'm here to tell you, that everyone here and everyone we're here representing, we are going to go to jail. We are going to get arrested. We are not going away. We are going to have our way. And I know that because it's always happened through history. So acceptance, folks, is the key to serenity. You have no future with LNG. You have no future with your pipelines. And you have no future against those of us who, again, will not allow it to happen. And Secretary Quigley, I know I'm over time, but please think about your legacies. Buck the system. You may not have a job in local in, in state government anymore, but do the right thing so history will say what Secretary Quigley did. Do the right thing. Because what we're talking about here and what we're all gathering to do is not the right thing. Thank you. That completes the list of folks who have signed up to speak, but is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak? Ma'am, please step forward and tell us your name. And take it to me. Hi, I'm Sharon Olt. I'm from Pine Grove Township, Schuylkill County, and I apologize, but I do not have a speech prepared. I'm going to speak from my heart. I am a landowner. And I realize I'm not going to stop the pipeline. I will do everything in my power to help everybody here to stop the pipeline. But I know I cannot buck the system. I cannot win. I cannot believe that there is not any law that prevents a pipeline to put a house in a hazard blast area. I am currently suffering from severe depression and anxiety because I cannot protect my house we worked hard to get the American dream like many other landowners here do. We would like your we, we would like to request you to help us. Please do not let the pipeline go through. If it must go through, do not put us in harm's way. I cannot sleep. I cannot protect my family. I cannot invite my grandkids to come to my house anymore because it won't be safe because it's within the 1,100 feet blast hazard area. Do you realize if that pipeline explodes, we're dead? Anybody within that hazard area is gone. Does anybody care about that? We're taxpayers. We work hard for the American dream. Please help us. Why should Williams be allowed? Williams Company for Atlantic Sun Sunlight's Sunrise Pipeline be allowed to lie, mislead, cheat, do whatever they can. It, it's unfair. I'm asking you to help us, the landowners, and every other landowner. Please intervene. Make them move out of the, the blast hazard area. How, there's building codes. You have to have inspections. How can a pipeline be in a blast hazard area? Please help the landowners. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else that hasn't had a chance to speak? Okay. Uh, one, once and done. Uh, is there anything else for the good of the order? All right. We are. We stand adjourned. Thank you.